Hello, I'm Alan Weil, Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs. Thank you so much for joining us for today's uh, release event associated with the February 2024 issue of Health Affairs devoted entirely to the topic of housing and health. Now, anyone who's been to any uh, recent health policy discussion has seen the increased attention being paid to what are often called the social determinants of health. And housing is always at the top of the list. When I look around the country and see what health systems are doing with respect to housing, a very large share of those activities are associated with unstable housing or homelessness, investments to try to provide people with a, a place to live. And those are very important dimensions. And we will discuss the role of unstable housing and inadequate housing in the briefing today. But what makes me uh, particularly excited about doing an issue on a topic like housing and health is that we get to see the many different dimensions of the relationship between housing and health beyond the ones that may have first come to mind. And so in addition, many of the papers in this month's issue touch on topics associated with uh, the quality of housing and the neighborhoods that people live in and the affordability of housing and the role that housing costs play in people's ability to meet their needs. So it is uh, really a privilege to be able to introduce you today to the February issue of Health Affairs that covers all of these topics and more. Um, I want to give you a little bit of a guidepost to our conversations today. We're going to have uh, four panels. There's no uh, obvious way to organize all of the material, but we loosely have grouped uh, the content into uh, four panels, one talking about communities and neighborhoods, one talking about interventions occurring in the health sector, one that focuses exclusively on homelessness, and then one that looks at housing costs, quality, and stability. So we'll go through those panels uh, sequentially over the time uh, that we have together today. Um, if you are watching us live, and I see that we have quite a few people who are still joining us as we get started, at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button. Uh, you can use that button to send questions in during the event. Uh, I will uh, review them as they come in and attempt to weave them into the conversations I have uh, with the panelists. Um, please try to keep your answers succinct. Um, please don't get them in right as the session is ending. And if they are of general interest, uh, I'm more likely to be able to try to find a way to include your questions in the conversation. Um, I uh, also want to note that as excited as we are about uh, the event we're holding today, we're engaging with our audience in many different ways associated with different dimensions of the topic of housing and health. Uh, we have digital abstract, video abstracts accompanying uh, many of the articles. Uh, there's an interactive timeline associated with uh, events in uh, Linden, Ohio that you'll be hearing about in uh, uh, just a few moments. Um, we'll have articles in Forefront, our rapid response, non-peer-reviewed outlet. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, other events, podcasts, and more all of which you will see linked on our uh, housing and health landing page at healthaffairs.org slash housing dash and dash health. Uh, I'll say this a few times, but we are recording today's event and within just a couple of days, uh, once we are able to, we will post it and we encourage you to uh, share the link uh, with, with others and look back at things you may have missed the first go around. Um, we also are pleased uh, this month to have artwork from the organization Art from the Streets, an Austin-based nonprofit that supports artists experiencing homelessness. We've incorporated their work into uh, the journal and into our events and uh, everywhere we are able to do so. Um, I am noticing that our attendance numbers are continuing to tick up, so I realize some of you are joining now. You may have missed my opening words, I assure you. Uh, the, the heart of the content is still to come, so please uh, uh, feel, uh, feel welcome even if you miss the first minute or two. But uh, as we move into the content, um, I do want to extend particular thanks to the foundations that make 
this work possible. We're grateful to uh, Kaiser Permanente as a lead funder, the Colorado Health Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the California Health Care Foundation, uh, uh, and the California Endowment, all of which have supported the issue. Um, I will also note that all of the articles being discussed today are available at no charge, and that's uh, in part due, uh, that entirely due to the support from our, the financial, uh, the support we've received from these organizations. Uh, two uh, theme advisors helped us navigate the process and select and review papers, Mariana Arcaya of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Ingrid Gould Ellen of New York University. We're grateful for the extra time and effort they made to make this so successful. It obviously takes a large team here at Health Affairs, but I wanna particularly acknowledge Ellen Baer, who was the um, lead editor uh, handling the papers on this issue. So uh, without further ado, let's get into the content of our session. Again, if you just joined us, we'll have four panels. We'll go through them sequentially. Um, I will have the opportunity for question and answer that you can submit using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. But as we begin, uh, I, we do have recorded remarks from uh, Bashara Shuker, Senior Vice President and Chief Health Officer at Kaiser Permanente. And uh, we'll show those remarks before we turn to our first panel. Hello, everyone. On behalf of Kaiser Permanente, I want to thank all of you for joining us today and contributing to the excellent work that went into producing Health Affairs' first ever housing and health thematic issue. The intersection between housing and health is something I care deeply about. When I was a family medicine intern, I met Ray at a homeless shelter in Houston. He was 55 at the time. As part of the visit, I was so keen about chatting with him about some important health screenings he needed to get, in particular, colorectal cancer screening. As we continued our conversation, I noticed that he was getting quieter. So I paused and I asked if he needed more information or maybe different information than what I was giving him. He looked at me and said, dude, this is my first time in a homeless shelter. I never thought I would end up here. I'm thinking about how I'm going to sleep here tonight. I don't know if it's safe. I'm thinking about where I'll get my next meal. I'm worried about how to get my life back. I really cannot focus on cancer screenings right now. I think about this conversation often. I needed to understand Ray's concerns that went far beyond any medical condition that he had now or might encounter down the road. And more than that, I had to understand that housing is health. All of us in this room know that without a safe, stable place to live, it's nearly impossible to maintain any health improvements achieved in a medical setting. That is why we are committed to addressing affordable housing and homelessness to improve health outcomes of the 68 million people who live in the communities we serve. And as the Chief Health Officer for Kaiser Permanente, I have the privilege of leading our work addressing the connections between housing and health. I remember there was so much energy around new partnerships and new ways of approaching housing and health when I first joined the organization. Over the years, we've brought on many partners and tried a lot of different things to see what would work. We looked to address the immediate health-related needs of people experiencing homelessness through whole person-centered approaches with a particular focus on medical respite. We're proud to have connected over 180,000 people to medical respite programs across the country. We've partnered with Community Solutions to strengthen homeless response systems through their Built for Zero movement. And since 2015, more than 170,000 individuals have been housed thanks to this movement. And 14 communities across the country have functionally ended homelessness for one particular population. We also work to expand housing related legal support for at-risk tenants to help prevent homelessness in the very first place. 
And since 2021, the legal aid organizations we've supported have been able to help prevent nearly 10,000 evictions for individuals and families living across five states. And through our impact investments and land donations, we help produce or preserve over 11,000 affordable housing units. Along this journey, we've learned a few things. First, we learned that it is possible to successfully bridge the unique strengths of the health and housing sectors to strengthen neighborhoods, drive equitable health outcomes, and help communities thrive. Second, we've learned that partnerships are key because no one organization can solve the homelessness crisis alone. That's why we've collaborated with community and local partners to drive the most effective change at the local level. And third, policy change needs to rely on solid evidence and research. That's why we felt it was so important to support this health affairs issue. Through sharing data, expert opinions, tangible solutions and results, we can help advance the field and help shift the narrative around solving housing instability and homelessness. I am so thrilled to learn from other experts today and our own respective roles, whether we are doctors, researchers, or community organizers, and I look forward to the work ahead. We appreciate uh, those uh, comments from Dr. Shuker and the support from uh, Kaiser Permanente. And now we'll move into our first panel, which will focus on the role of communities and neighborhoods. Uh, we have three panelists who I will introduce now, and then we'll turn to their presentations. Mariana Arkaya, Professor of Urban Planning and Public Health in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, as noted, uh, uh, one of the two advisors for this uh, theme issue and wrote one of the overview papers for the issue. Uh, Arthur Colon, University of uh, Washington, uh, who has a pa paper uh, discussing gentrification. And uh, Kiara Barnett at Nationwide Children's Hospital discussing uh, uh, transitions in one neighborhood in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I will turn first uh, to Mariana to kick us off with uh, the overview. Great, thank you so much. I am really pleased to be here. Thank you for having me and for allowing me to present on behalf of my co-authors, um, Ingrid Gould, Ellen, and Justin Steele. And while many of the papers in this special issue delve into housing's um, stability, housing stability, housing cost, quality, among other issues, um, our paper really foregrounds the fact that it's housing's location in neighborhoods is one of the central reasons um, it matters for health. Um, Next slide, please. So as we note in the paper, um, public services, as well as many public goods from garbage collection to public safety, um, school resources, these are all allocated at the local level. And we know that neighborhoods determine our daily exposure to a host of social and environmental health risks and resources. And we can think about um, the literature on neighborhood-based um, exposures for health as organized into four main pathways. Um, next slide, please. So our theories say that first neighborhoods come with a set of institutions that structure our access to and also the quality of services that matter for health. For example, healthcare facilities, um, you can think about transit organizations, library systems, food systems, such as grocery stores or farmers markets. Um, in a second pathway, uh, we are exposed to the material or physical environment of our neighborhoods. Um, and, these, and these physical environments determine um, our exposure to things like crosswalks or tree canopy cover, but also to air pollution or extreme heat, among other examples. Third, there are exposures that stem from neighborhoods' social environments. Um, for example, collective efficacy, which is a community's shared belief in its capacity to achieve change, um, as well as community power, which is a community's ability to take action it needs um, in order to achieve community change, are thought to improve um, conditions that sustain health, while violent crime rate is thought to harm health. And fourth, we know that neighborhood-based social networks matter. Um, our neighbors communicate information and norms that are relevant to health. So what does the literature say empirically? 
Well, we know there are thousands of studies that document the clustering of health conditions by neighborhoods and disparities in life expectancy by neighborhood um, is one prime example of this clustering. And um, plenty of studies show associational links between neighborhood characteristics and health outcomes. But most of the research um, out there really can't support causal interpretations. Um, there is some causal evidence, however, showing on the protective side, um, the health promoting power of green space, of walkable neighborhoods, of access to healthy food, um, and also of moving from high to low poverty environments. And this last point, of course, comes from the famous moving to opportunity experiment. Um, and on the other side of the coin, there is also evidence for causal um, health risks. So the literature suggests um, that proximity to environmental hazards, such as landfills, major roads, and industry actually heightens the risk for cardiovascular disease and cancer, while neighborhood deprivation and violent crime rates uh, may causally adverse, um, adversely affect mental health. So, um, there's a lot of literature, and but most of it does not give us um, a lot of confidence in talking about um, the precise individual associations between individual health outcomes and individual neighborhood risk factors. So in a way, there's this apparent contradiction that we write about in the paper between this kind of indisputable, indisputable fact that health is patterned by neighborhoods on the one hand, and then this lack of rigorous causal evidence that links um, individual neighborhood risk factors to individual health outcomes on the other. And this could mean many things, but one possible um, interpretation is that it is really neighborhood systems of advantage overall, which can't be measured as a single risk factor that truly affects health. And one of our main research recommendations is that our field look more deeply at the arrangements and social policies that have created neighborhood inequality so that these neighborhood arrangements, the, the arrangements and structures that produce neighborhoods can be effectively challenged. Because while we as a scholarly community are not so sure about the magnitude of the isolated causal effects of individual exposures on individual outcomes, the literature as a whole is very convincing that disparities in exposures to neighborhood-based risk and protective factors by race and ethnicity, by socioeconomic status, by other social stratifiers, does contribute to health disparities along these same lines. And so um, taking all of that into consideration, um, how might we work to ensure that neighborhoods actually promote health equity by, by making sure neighborhood conditions are actually equitable? Um, there are a lot of recommendations in the paper, but I'm gonna quickly note six here. Um, First, better enforcement of fair housing laws should be the first step towards addressing continued discrimination in all sorts of housing transactions, but we also need policies that will make um, affirmative changes to address disparities in housing and neighborhoods. Um, the affirmatively furthering fair housing provision of the Fair Housing Act of 1968 asks localities to address health disparities that are tied to disparities in place-based resources. And this, um, these types of efforts can look like anything from um, efforts to protect existing affordable housing to anti-displacement efforts. Um, one of the, se the second recommendation is reforming land use regulations, um, which includes things like ex eliminating exclusionary zoning policies that actually perpetuate separate and unequal metropolitan um, structures by race, ethnicity, income, and other social stratifiers. Our third recommendation is um, to support reforms that could help optimize the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, reforms that will address things like allowing people to use vouchers in neighboring areas by using um, zip code level rent ceilings for vouchers um, so that people's uh, uh, the voucher amount is not tied to a geographic area that they are not um, truly able to access. The fourth recommendation is around place-based investments. And so in, play, in neighborhoods that have been um, historically marginalized, um, have not benefited from development, but have actually been, um, had wealth extracted from them uh, over time, place-based investments that will infuse resources into neighborhood-based institutions and physical environments um, are important. Fifth, we note the importance of taking a reparative planning approach to thinking about neighborhood inequality. Um, and a reparative planning approach here would mean uh, 
planning with the goal of redressing economic, racial, ethnic group inequality at the urban and regional levels, um, primarily through the provision of stable, affordable housing in thriving neighborhoods for the, for the households that have borne the brunt of unequal community structures in the past. And six, um, our, last, our last policy recommendation is supporting community-led actions um, that complement policies and systems um, change that uh, local governments and regional governments, state and federal governments can undertake. Community-led actions um, that, that we note as examples include local, local reparations projects, ba basic income programs, equity-focused commitments to pedestrian safety, urban greening initiatives, and things like mutual aid systems. And so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for that uh, terrific overview of the many dimensions uh, that uh, neighborhoods have uh, that affect health. We'll turn uh, now to uh, Arthur Ecola. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present our paper. This is joint work with, with colleagues that are listed at the University of Washington and, and Cornell University. And we brought together sociologists, epidemiologists, public policy researchers to really examine how neighborhood changes in the form of gentrification yield changes in contextual determinant of health that, and, and how those changes differ across racial and ethnic groups. Uh, next slide, please. And so place-based health disparities are well documented as, as Mariana mentioned, and to a large extent they mirror segregation patterns along racial and ethnic lines. But there are also important differences and, and where households are able to access housing uh, therefore really direct implication for, for their health. Uh, the Robert Wood Hanson Foundation supported this effort to, to implement um, a, a track level life expectancy measure that was released and, 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 and quite advertised. And, and what you see here in the case of, of Chicago is that you have neighborhoods within the same city where life expectancy range from 69 to 85 years. And, and those are, are really, really wide gap that they're especially very, very closely linked. And when you look at where 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 high life expectancy or low life expectancy are, you, you have places like Hyde Park that are highly integrated, racially diverse, where life expectancy is 82 years old. And just to the west of it, Washington Park, where life expectancy is 30 years less. And, and you have other other areas that are in close proximity but have very different characteristics in terms of their determinant of health that also have wide variation in um, in health in, in health and life expectancy. In this study, we examine how gentrification is associated with changes in four contextual determinants of health: healthcare access measured through medically underserved areas, social deprivation measured through area deprivation index, and air pollution measured through NO2, PM2.5, and PM10, as well as walkability. And so we have those four different categories of, of contextual determinant of health. And we, we looked at how they, they, they vary in relationship with um, gentrification and changes in, in neighborhood in six cities that have experienced really different level of gentrification and have different racial ethnic composition. So we look at Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, Philadelphia, San Francisco, and, and Seattle. Is, and the goal is to examine to what extent original residents of gentrifying neighborhoods as of 2006 experienced changing in their contextual determinant of health by 2021. So over a 15 years period, what, what happened to both the neighborhood in which they are, they are, they are living as well as if they move the neighborhood in which they are moving to. And so their, their origin and destination neighborhood. And, and those move might reflect choice, but they might also in the case of gentrification really reflect that displacement pressure that lead them to 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 leave neighborhood where they were living. Next slide, please. We use uh, continuous trace data to capture those individual location in 2006 and 2021 at the address level. So we know for for about 80% of the population where where they were living as of 2006 and where they are living in in 2021. And we we have some some really we are able to 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 match it then to their their neighborhood characteristics, but we don't have a lot of information about those individual. In this project, we define gentrifying tracks as those with median household income that are below 80% of the area median income as of 2000 and experience above median increase in the share of residents that are college educated in median rent 
or median income between 2000 and 2021. And so this, this measure is based on the existing literature and we, 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 we built on this literature to apply to changes in contextual determinant of health. Um, next slide, please. So on, on the left here, we, we create that map showing uh, the gentrification status, and it might be hard to see on your, your screen, but in, in gray, the census tract that have gray outline are there that are low income, low and moderate income tracts, but that are not gentrifying, and those in with a black outline, uh, although that are gentrifying during our time period. And here we are depicting the area deprivation index. And if you look, look at it next to the, the, the life expectancy map, you see quite a bit of, of, of spatial overlap. There are some differences. But the thing that I want really here to highlight is the extent to which the gentrifying tracks are on those border between high and low deprivation index. Like generally, gentrifying, gentrification happens to successive waves from areas that are approximate to, to, to higher income, um, more low, lower deprivation tracks. And, and, and they tend to also be an area of transition with regard to some of those measures on life expectancy. Um, next slide, please. And when we look at other indicators, including the, the air pollution measure we mentioned, we see that same, same pattern of gentrifying areas really being at that border between higher and lower level of, of, of the contextual determinant of health measure that we have. In this case, we are showing PM 2.5. And you can see those, the, you can see actually a little bit better here, some of those, those, those uh, black outline being in those, those transitioning area, where a lot of, many of the low and moderate income tracks that are not gentrifying are in the, are in the areas with the, the, the highest level of pollution in that case, and, and tend to be also areas with, uh, with worse life expectancy. Um, next slide, please. And so, so our finding uh, from our analysis is that overall residents of gentrifying areas initially already live in neighborhoods that have more favorable contextual determinant of health. Right, they are in those transitioning areas, those border areas where where generally the the, the contextual determinant of health are slightly higher than residents of low and moderate income neighborhoods that are not gentrifying. And this is true across race and, and ethnicity. For for all for all, all groups, we, we see the same patterns in the six cities that we examine. Um, but in the six cities we examine, we also see that residents of gentrifying neighborhood uh, experience more of an improvement in the likelihood of not being in a medically underserved area over the 2006 2021 period, and that's also hold for all racial and ethnic groups. And so that that measure of access to to care um, seems to improve in in for residents of gentrifying neighborhood, whether they stay in that neighborhood or, or move out. But what we find is that for, for, for Black and Hispanic residents, as well as for residents from another, another race, they experience worse outcome in terms of changes in, in neighborhood social deprivation and overall life expectancy. And, and those were partially negative in, in the cases of neighborhood that used to be majority people of color neighborhood and experience gentrification. When we break down the, the changes between movers and stayers, what we see is that the negative outcomes are really most pronounced among movers. And that, that's really consistent with displacement, pushing residents out of gentrifying neighborhoods to neighborhoods with worse contextual determinants of health. And so those findings really are consistent with gentrification having slightly worse consequences in terms of exposure to contextual determinants of health for individuals of colors, and partially where the gentrifying neighborhood used to be a majority community of colors. And so letting people stay in those neighborhoods or, or supporting them in moving the neighborhood with, with better, better contextual determinant of health has potentially a, a large or, or, or meaningful impact on their ability to, 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 to be experiencing positive uh, health outcome and, and health environment, health supportive environment. And so that's consistent with, with this idea of you being able to use housing choice voucher to move to, to places that, that are health supportive or to invest in place in order to, to let them stay and benefit from the improvement in contextual determinant of health that we observe in the gentrifying neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move to Kira Barnett. We'll talk about uh, Linden, Ohio. Thanks, Alan. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to Health Affairs for this opportunity to share the work uh, that myself and my colleagues have been engaging in. Um, so we're super excited to talk today um, about the history of the impacts of discriminatory policies on housing and maternal and infant health in an Ohio neighborhood. Next slide. So our 
Uh, my co-authors and I came to this project uh, really interested in understanding more about what we can do about this longstanding racial disparities in maternal and infant health, both at a national level um, and locally here in central Ohio. Um, so we know that Healthy People 2030 sets goals for different health initiatives, infant mortality being one of them. Uh, we know that nationally we reached our Healthy People 2020 a 2030 goal for white infants as early as 2012. And we have yet to reach that, that um, goal for our black infants. Um, and we need to drop infant mortality rates by nearly 53% uh, in the next seven years or six years in order to do so. Um, and so we are coming to this trying to understand what we can do to, to reduce those disparities. We know that these disparities are not driven by genetic differences um, in our populations, but they're driven by inequities in social determinants of health, with housing being a really key social determinant. When we think about solutions to address housing, as we heard from our first speaker, uh, community redevelopment initiatives can have, uh, they have the potential to modify some of the neighborhood and housing characteristics that we see um, as driving some of the health disparities within communities. My co-author and I also recognize that structural racism and discrimination are deeply embedded in housing policies and practices. Um, and in order to have community redevelopment initiatives that can address these problems, uh, we will have to consider how structural racism and discrimination kind of plays a role um, in how these communities got to where they are today. Um, and we have to think about how can we embed some of that knowledge into our development efforts um, in order to see lasting change within the communities. Next slide. So that kind of brings us to our main study, which is the Targeted Investment and Meaningful Engagement Study, or TIME study, as we refer to it. The main objective of the study is to answer that question. So how can structural racism and discrimination inform strategic community development, improve health outcomes, and specifically infant and uh, maternal health outcomes in communities? So this study really focuses on the Linden neighborhood here in Columbus, Ohio. So to give our audience some context about Linden, Linden is a neighborhood that is northeast of downtown Columbus. Um, it has about 19,000 residents of whom 63% are black. Um, the community is, um, half the community lives below the federal poverty level. Um, and Linden has seen some inequities in a lot of different social determinants of health. So we see high levels of unemployment, high levels of vacancy uh, rates in property. We see high crime rates in Linden, um, and we see high infant mortality rates as well. Um, but despite all of, all of those kind of negative or disparities that we see, I also want to uplift that there are so many assets in Linden, like so many other communities that experience similar challenges. And so we see a lot of uh, pride within uh, London residents, and we see a lot of uh, local initiatives happening that are starting by residents to address some of these needs. But we recognize that um, we as uh, large anchor institutions within these communities also have a role to play uh, to better the outcomes and the conditions of communities as well. Next slide. And so here in this paper, we're highlighting the findings of an extensive policy inventory that provides a timeline of structural racism and discriminatory policies that have impacted housing and health within Linden over the last 100 years. Um, so it might be a little small to see. Alan referenced that there is an interactive timeline that Health Affairs put together to accompany this paper. So this is kind of a snapshot of what that looks like. Um, so I uh, really recommend you all check it out when you get the chance. Um, but it walks through this history and we walk through in our paper this history over the last 100 years of these policies that have impacted this community. So we start in the 1920s looking at racial deed restrictions. So as buildings were being put up in the community, these restrictions were being uh, placed on the properties that uh, restricted Black residents from uh, owning the property. Um, and so that was used to maintain the, the white makeup of the community and, and segregate the community. And then we kind of go all the way uh, to present day where you know, we see the subprime lending crisis that happened in 2008 and its impact on Linden and destabilizing the community uh, as it did so many other uh, communities across the nation. One of the cool things about this timeline and what we include in the paper is it also gives you the opportunity to look at how demographic shifts happen in each decade. So we can see how as each of these policies happen, we see these neighborhood shifts in terms of uh, Linden that was once 96% white become 63% black uh, over the 100 years. 
Um, and then we also tell a story of what happens and what we see in terms of infant mortality. So we're telling the story of how these policies had an impact on the demographics of the community, the social determinants of the community, and ultimately the health of the, of the community in this paper. Next slide. And then we conclude this manuscript really addressing structural racism and discrimination uh, in form strategic community development. We want to emphasize that the story that we tell about Linden is not unique and that many urban neighborhoods across the nation have faced similar challenges. Um, and so what that means is this work has the potential to have impacts on other communities as we can replicate the findings and the learnings from this project in other areas as well. We recognize that community development is well situated to create anti-racist or racism conscious approaches that allow for more on the ground context and nuance um, and the type of work that we do. And however, we recognize that there is more research that's needed to deter determine how best we can engage in that work. And so that's what we're doing in this project. Uh, this is this paper and this, um, this, this timeline is kind of the first step in our process of understanding that history and then kind of what's forthcoming from our research in this work is uh, really to understand how do we take that learning and incorporate it uh, into the community development plans that our partners are engaging in. Um, and yeah, super excited to talk more about it. And that's it. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. So those are three very different uh, approaches that they all uh, relate to this notion of the role of community. We don't have a lot of time for questions, but let me uh, quickly ask. Um, one of the things that stands out here is the multiple layers of uh, disadvantage, notwithstanding, uh, Carrie, your comment about the assets and strengths, but the layering of dis disinvestment uh, uh, in infrastructure and the like. I wonder, um, and, and Mariana, you started with sort of the, the causal evidence uh, is not as uh, rich as the associative evidence. But if we were to start with a community, and Kira, in some sense, this is what you are trying to do, you start with a community that's facing these uh, barriers, what's the right place to start, either substantively or procedurally? Like, you know, When you look at the whole weight of the evidence, where would you begin with trying to improve the living conditions of a community uh, in ways that would support better health. Mariana, you want to start with that? Um, sure, I'll, I'll probably give a very unsatisfying answer um, because I think you know the answer is it depends on what the existing community would want to see, and you know um, there's many ways that you could. So even the causal evidence, right? Like you can say. Well, there's pretty good causal evidence on green, green space and tree canopy cover when it comes to health protective factors. But how do you implement that green space and where do you put it? And like, and in it's displacing what other infrastructure? And that really, I really think that the the process there is to work with the community that stands to gain the most or lose the most. Um, most impacted by those decisions, especially communities that have kind of borne the brunt of being excluded from a decision-making process, making sure that they're at the table and saying, well, how would you want what, you know, how would we want these resources invested? How would we want this infrastructure updated? Um, so I think it's got to start with the community from, from my perspective. I don't think that's a disappointing answer at all. So. <laughs> Um, I saw some heads nodding, but I don't know if either if you want to uh, add anything to that. Yeah, okay. I'll add to that. I think, and it's kind of the work that we're doing and what we talk about in this paper is that understanding the history of how these communities got here is really important. Um, but I agree that we also have to uh, engage the community in that process. So as outsiders, we can come in and we can kind of read and, and learn what happened. But a part of that understanding the history of communities is also talking to community members. Um, as I mentioned, this is this paper is a, the first step in our process, but we're also uh, doing interviews with Black birthing people who've lived in the community uh, over the last 50 plus years to hear what their experiences have been. So that as we think about, again, what sort of things do we want to invest in or should we be invested in, we can incorporate some of that um, narrative and that lived experience. Great. I'm going to ask uh, uh, two questions that came in from the audience. One is a little narrower uh, for Arthur. Um, it, I'm not going to read it exactly. This is a fairly long question, but it has to do with the notion of the the 
differences you found between those who relocated due to gentrification and those who stayed and whether how that overlays with the influx of resources into a community that's gentrifying relative to the resources of the communities that people relocated to. If you could just add, uh, give a little more nuance on that. Yeah, and so for, for the time varying indicator that we have, what we see that they tend to be an improvement in this indicator in the gentrifying areas. And so for, for households that are able to stay, there are some benefits to, to that gentrification from, from this contextual determinant of health measure. But for those who are moving on, on net, they seem to be moving to slightly worse, worse neighborhood in terms of those characteristics. So that, that what is driving that difference between mover and stairs is if the positive changes in in the gentrifying neighborhood on those on the dimension we capture, and and the fact that those where we're moving out move to to slightly worse off neighborhood on those dimensions. So it really is a di displacement effect as well as a for for those who depart. And then I'm going to close. I had this thought, and uh, someone asked a question also from the audience, having to do with the evidence base. And again, Mariana, you started with sort of the causal. Uh, obviously, we're talking about humans and lives in neighborhoods, things that don't lend themselves to a randomized controlled trial. Um, I appreciated the first answer about listening to the community. That I think, uh, I'm, I'm very glad you went there. But as we listen to communities, we also like to be able to provide, share with the community where we do have evidence that investments can make a difference. So I wonder if any of you could make a comment about sort of how we should think about uh, the evidence base, uh, for making good decisions about community investments in, beyond uh, listening to the community itself. You all nodded, but one of you has to speak. <laughs> I, 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 not to dominate, but my paper was supposed to do this, so I'm happy to take this question. Um, yeah, so I mean, the 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 evidence, the causal evidence really uh, is strong, I would say strongest on, um, green space and blue space, which is, you know, water views, water access, um, walkability, um, health, access to healthy foods. Um, and uh, also for, um, in terms of social environment, violent crime rates, and also neighborhood deprivation, which, you know, one measure of which might be poverty rate. Um, so, you know, lower poverty rate, lower violent crime rate, I would be considered on the protective side. Uh, I mean, the problem with this is, right, like, how do you lower neighborhood poverty? Do you move a bunch of rich people in? Do you display? I mean, so it's like you do have these kind of causal effects, but they really are not that instructive about, like, what action do you take with this community at this time, given the, the systems that are present? And I think um, so this is why we go back to that process point of not, I didn't mean disappointing before, but I meant frustrating if you're looking for the answer crosswalks, but you got to work with the community because how do you make a change based on those causal findings, I think is really the tricky part. And that's where the urban planning public health connection needs to be strong. Um, and then the last thing I would say on the evidence base is I think that there people do grapple with this contradiction of why do we see this persistent, durable relationship between neighborhoods and health, um, no matter where you look, right? Thousands and thousands of studies. But then people say, well, you can't prove a causal effect here of this one individual isolated neighborhood-based exposure on this one individual isolated health outcome. It is systems of advantage and it's what are the institutional arrangements? What are the structures that stack the deck for some people and stack the, get, the, the deck against other people? And I really think that's where we need to be aiming our, um, our research and our intervention. And I'll just quickly add to your point, like, yes, it is the complexity of how these things are intertwined that makes finding the evidence a little bit challenging or difficult. Um, but even in, you know, referencing our, our manuscript, when we think about where we are today, we can look back at history and see how many things have compounded on top of each other to get the communities to where we see today. And so we have to also recognize that in order to come out of that and fix it, it's going to take some time. And I think that we as researchers, the funders have to acknowledge that it's going to take some time. So we might and do all this investment and do all this work. And we might see change in the next generation. We probably won't see it tomorrow, but that's okay as long as we're constantly moving the needle forward um, to see some change. Uh, I would just add that it will be time and, and coordinated action on, on a range of action. It can just be adding sidewalk or adding trees, right? It has to, to really address those, those, those layers and layers of, of health beneficial or detrimental dimension that, uh, that neighborhoods have. 
Well, this has been a great uh, kickoff to the program. Thank you all for your papers and your contributions today. I think it really does give a picture of how uh, complicated the relationship is, uh, even for those who are stably housed, even for those who uh, we tend not to uh, uh, focus on with some of the interventions. There's, there's so much work to be done here. So thank you. And we'll turn now to our uh, second panel. I will introduce them as they begin to come on the screen. Uh, the second panel is going to focus on uh, interventions within the health sector designed to address housing and housing related uh, social needs. We'll hear from Mary Catherine Arbor at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, Katie Huber at uh, Duke University and Alec Chapman at the University of Utah. They have uh, three, again, quite different papers uh, that look at different dimensions of the relationship between the health sector and housing. Uh, Mary Catherine, I'll turn first to you. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here to present the findings from an evaluation of a housing intervention executed in Brigham Primary Care uh, that reduced outpatient visits and patients reported improvements in mental and physical health. Um, this is the work of a team. The research team is on the screen and I'll share with you the implementation team at the end of this presentation. This is a work of many people. Next slide, please. So to start from a common, common definition, housing instability, which is the lack of access to safe and affordable housing, is associated with poor mental and physical health, less effective healthcare engagement, and higher costs. And I think the last three presenters did a great job outlining that these inequities are rooted in unfair historical policies. So on the left, you see a map of redlining in Boston. And on the right, you see the distribution of um, heart disease hospitalizations by neighborhood, and the darker areas have higher heart hospitalization rates, and they overlay the areas of historical redlining. Now, what we know, and we'll see on the next slide, is that the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, exacerbated those inequities. So in August 2020, one in three Massachusetts renters reported that they were unable to pay their rent but that was not shared equally among all renters. You can see that 50% of black renters, 39% of Hispanic renters were unable to pay their rent as compared to only 15% of white renters. And on the right, you see a graph that shows the larger the orange dot is, that is the higher rate of eviction filings by neighborhood. And as you move to the right, there's a greater proportion of people of color in the neighborhood. And as you move from bottom to top, there's a greater COVID incidence in the neighborhood. So what this shows is that neighborhoods with people of color tended to have higher COVID incidents and much higher, double the rates of eviction filings. In that context, the Brigham Center of Excellence for Primary Care developed an upstream housing program that was focused not only on supporting patients who were unhoused, but also those who were at risk of homelessness. Um, and we focused on preventing eviction. Next slide. The Brigham and Women's Hospital is a large academic facility in Boston, in the greater Boston area, and the primary care um, services include 15 primary care clinics serving about 190,000 patients. Next slide. We began screening in primary care for social determinants of health in 2018, which is when uh, Massachusetts Medicaid introduced SDOH screening as a requirement. And the graph on the left shows that every year we increased both the number and the proportion of our patients who we screened for eight domains of social need. On the right, you see the prevalence of those needs in our primary care population. And 50% of Brigham primary care patients are screening positive for one or more social determinant of health or health-related social need. And more than 30% screen positive for housing needs. Next slide. As our screening rates increased, the number of referrals for housing needs to our social care team increased from 20 per month in 2020 to 100 per month in that same, same year. And then by the end of 2022, it was 250 housing referrals per month. And by the end of 2023, it was 350 referrals for housing needs per month. Now, we know this because we have a single centralized order where any provider or staff member can send a patient with an identified social need to our social care team. And that team has several roles and many people who respond to those needs for the 15 clinics in partnership with the clinical teams. Next slide. For this housing intervention, we used a team-based triage approach to enable upstream housing intervention. 
The first role on our team is a community resource specialist. They are the first responders and they reach out and support 60 to 80 patients per month with any of those social needs, any one of those eight domains. And they provide short-term telephonic support with resource information. But when they find patients who have a higher level of need for care management or navigation, they can escalate the case to a community health worker or for housing needs that meet certain criteria, they refer them to a housing advocate. The housing advocate is a specialized community health worker and we tried to focus their work on patients who were unhoused, at risk of eviction, or living in unsafe or unhealthy housing conditions. And the entire team is supported by a partnership with Medical Legal Partner Boston, MLPB, that conducts biweekly multidisciplinary case review. Next slide. To move upstream, that necessitated explicit operational definitions because we wanted to focus our specialized resources on patients with imminent housing crises. And specifically, it's the bottom definition for stably housed patients who desire a change that needed the most refinement, because these are patients that we refer to community partners for support, and we do not serve them within our program um, because their housing needs are less pressing. So we focus on homelessness, patients at risk of eviction, and patients with unsafe or unhealthy housing. Next slide. Given that, and given that screening increases identification, most evidence comes from programs that focus on unhoused patients and less is known about programs like this, we aim to do an evaluation of more than 1,000 patients who participated in the housing program and 5,000 matched comparison patients. This was a retrospective mixed methods evaluation that aimed to answer three questions. The first was, was the housing program participation associated with differences in healthcare use or chronic disease control? The second was, who are the patients served and the services provided? And then the last was a series of interviews where we sought to understand from the patient's perspective what their experiences in the program were and what were their perceived effects on their health and well-being. Next slide. Our first finding is that the housing program participation was associated with reductions in healthcare use. The top light yellow box shows there were no associations with emergency use, inpatient use, but there were associations, a reduction in 3.6, uh, housing program participants had 3.6 fewer visits than matched non-participants and two and a half fewer primary care visits. If we get the next slide, you can see that this reduction was driven, nope, last one, was driven by an 81% reduction in social work visits and a 60% reduction in behavioral health, psychiatry, and urgent care visits. Next slide. The second finding is that the patients served by this program were higher risk patients at baseline. Demographically, they were 70% female, 30% younger than 20, and 60% Spanish speaking. And on the right, you can see that in comparison to the Brigham Health primary care population in general, they were predominantly Medicaid insured and were great, had a greater proportion of Black and Hispanic patients. At baseline, they had more healthcare utilization and were more likely to have chronic conditions, hypertension, diabetes, and depression. But interestingly, the chronic disease control was similar between the two groups. Next slide. On the left, you can see that the majority of the patients served by the housing program were in the three housing case types we prioritized, those at risk of eviction, homeless, or use, ha, experiencing unsafe or unhealthy housing. 30% were still in that stably housed category, and that is because um, the triage was developed during this evaluation period. Next slide. The project findings that are most compelling to me is the, are the patient voices. And what you see here is four themes. The first of which is patients participate in this program because of compounding stressors. There were multiple things that led to their participation here. The second one is that there are health improvements associated with their new housing. So the patients reported, and if you look at the bottom, living here, my health has improved. Before I came here, I was always at, already at the peak of being diabetic, but today I've gone to the clinic and they've done tests in which the result is that the threat of becoming diabetic has disappeared. I've lost about 40 pounds and I feel better. I feel more agile having lost those pounds. Next slide. 
The third theme is that patients reported improved mental health, not only associated with their new housing, but associated with their interactions with their housing advocate. This was the most consistent theme of the interviews that people deeply appreciated the support that they received. So the first quote I think is very- I, 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 I need you to one. move to the last thing, please. All right. So let me go to the next slide. Next one. You know, it's rare to find a healthcare housing intervention that supports patients upstream like this. The null impacts on chronic disease control with one year of follow-up are not surprising. The, some of the studies in the literature find those impacts four to seven years later or 10 to 15 years later. But these outcomes were included because hospital administrators seeking sustainable program funding report that absent significant operational impact, arguing for institutional investment is difficult in the setting of constrained resources. So one of our key recommendations is introducing broader measures of success, including social return on investment, reduction in school absenteeism and work absenteeism and others. These programs can't be judged only on their healthcare utilization impact. And the patient voice really makes visible hidden benefits that are included in their health, but also the support and compassion that they receive from the care team as they experience housing stressors and indignities. Our last slide holds our recommendations that we recommend refining these interventions to address imminent housing crises and forging cross-sector partnerships necessary for innovating broader measures of success, rendering screening actionable rather than only asking patients about needs and leaving the care team to hold those identified needs, know what the solutions are and feel powerless to enact them, which is the cause of moral injury and burnout in healthcare. And that we should also do more to advocate and create more affordable housing. Any program, including ours, that's predicated on outcompeting others for scarce existing resources may have a powerful impact, but will have limited reach. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll turn now uh, to Katie Huber. Thank you. Hi, I'm Katie Huber. I'm a senior policy analyst at the Duke Margolis Institute for Health Policy at Duke University. And I'm really pleased to present today about our new research article on addressing housing related social needs through Medicaid based on lessons from our study of North Carolina's Healthy Opportunities pilots. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Health Affairs for organizing this theme issue and briefing event and also acknowledge my large team of co-authors who are listed on the slide here. Next slide, please. North Carolina offers one of the nation's most expansive Medicaid programs to address health related social needs through its Healthy Opportunities Pilots Program which was created using a Section 1115 waiver authorities. At a high level, the pilots aims to address four domains of health-related social needs, including housing. And the delivery model involves three regional networks of community-based organizations, or CBOs, that provide pilot services. And then they receive reimbursement from the state's Medicaid managed care plans who manage the program funding. The pilot's housing domain includes nine services, which we classify into three categories. Housing Navigation Case Management supports enrollees in finding and maintaining stable long-term housing. Housing Quality and Safety Modifications include services to eliminate home-based health and safety risks. And Housing and Utility Cost Mitigation, which includes coverage of certain expenses related to securing housing, such as first month's rent. Next slide, please. So our objective for this study was to identify lessons learned, innovations, and actionable insights from the design and implementation of the pilot's housing services to help inform the efforts of other states and federal policymakers who are working to address housing and security through Medicaid at scale. To do this, we used a mixed methods approach. And for the qualitative portion, we spoke with people involved in the design and implementation of the pilots through key informant interviews and expert stakeholder meetings. We also held two focus groups with community members who had experiences with North Carolina Medicaid and pilot services. And we also analyzed quantitative data on local housing problems and pilots housing service delivery to understand how housing needs vary across the state's geography and how pilots housing service delivery accounts for that variation. Next slide, please. So from our research, we identified four cross-cutting themes that highlight promising practices for housing service design and implementation of Medicaid. And I'll provide a, an overview of those in the next slides. In our first theme, we describe how the housing landscape varies within and across the pilots regions with features that make them distinct from one another and from other areas of the country, 
with important implications for addressing housing needs. We write about these in more detail in our article, but for some examples, uh, the coastal part of the state is vulnerable to hurricanes and interviewees in the eastern and southeastern regions said that this creates housing challenges in their regions. Interviewees also told us that the southeastern region includes coastal areas where most construction is for luxury properties, which contributes to insufficient affordable housing in the region. And the Western Pilots region has the highest proportion of older homes with inadequate plumbing. So together, we found that these landscape features really contribute to variation in severe housing problems, which are shown in the figure on the right, which influence the distribution of pilots housing services that have been provided to date across regions as shown in exhibit two. The Department of Housing and Urban Development defines severe housing problems as housing units with inadequate kitchens, inadequate plumbing, overcrowding, or housing cost burden. So in each pilot's region, we identified census tracts in the top quartile statewide for each problem, and then categorized them into tracts with quality issues, so units with inadequate kitchens or plumbing, and tracts with availability issues, units with overcrowding or housing cost burden. And we found that the Western region had the highest percentage of tracts with significant quality issues, which are shown in the map in orange. The Southeastern region, in contrast, had the highest percentage of tracts with significant availability issues, which are in dark blue. And the Eastern region had the highest proportion of tracts with significant challenges in both quality and availability, which are the red areas of the map. And as you'll see in the figure on the right, we observed that the distribution of pilot services provided in each region was influenced by the distribution of severe housing problems that were shown in the map. And so together, these findings really point toward the importance of developing programs with diverse service offerings to be able to meet a range of housing needs. Next slide, please. Our second theme discusses the complexity of defining and pricing housing services. Several of Pilot's housing services have flexible definitions to cover a variety of needs. Our interviewees told us that they appreciated the, this flexibility as it allowed them to creatively meet people's needs, but also noted some key limitations of some service definitions. Pilot's housing services were also difficult to price to accommodate this flexibility in service definitions. The housing domain contains the program's most expensive services, for example, accessibility and safety modifications authorize up to $10,000 per enrollee. But interviewees told us that caps on some services were still too low to meet their clients' needs and to cover the true costs of service delivery. For other programs, we present several considerations related to defining and pricing housing services, including pairing flexible service definitions with appropriate quality guardrails and continually reassessing service prices to ensure they reflect the true cost of services in the context of changes like inflation. Our third theme describes how successful implementation of housing services depends on engaging diverse stakeholders. And while engaging stakeholders outside of the health sector is really important for all social needs domains, the housing domain involves working with several unique stakeholders with important nuances. For example, many of the pilots housing services require CBOs to work with landlords, a third party with legal rights pertaining to enrollee services. And while many CBOs working in other domains deliver services themselves, many CBOs providing housing services had to contract with independent con construction contractors to provide these services. So we learned that many CBOs in the housing space leveraged housing related partnerships and infrastructure outside of the pilots to assist with this added complexity and to provide additional assistance to clients. Moving forward and for other programs, closer partnerships with housing and social service infrastructure beyond the health sector could be helpful for addressing housing needs beyond Medicaid. And lastly, our fourth theme highlights the need for creative financial models to sustain CBO capacity. Because housing is the most expensive pilot service domain and because of the, current, the program's current reimbursement model design, upfront costs for service delivery can become increasingly unmanageable for CBOs as referral volume increases. Pilot entities have just developed a few creative short-term solutions to help address this, which we write about in our article. And in the longer term and for other programs, there's interest in exploring a transition to alternative payment models to provide more flexibility and a path to sustainability. Next slide, please. So we hope our research motivates continued innovation and progress in addressing health and housing related social needs through Medicaid. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, Alec, over to you. All right, thank you uh, everyone for being here. So my name is Alec Chapman. I'm a data scientist at the University of Utah. I'm a PhD student in biostatistics. 
And I'm gonna be presenting on some work with um, this, this great team of people here that we've been doing in the Department of Veterans Affairs. So next slide, please. Um, so veterans are historically overrepresented in the homeless population. And uh, the VA has really put a lot of effort in the past 20 years or so to address this. And one of the ways that they've done this is they've opened and run a number of very large homelessness programs for veterans who are either homeless or at risk of becoming homeless. And one of the largest of these is a program called SSVF. And this is really the VA's kind of rapid response approach to homelessness, where it's meant to be very uh, quick and a very immediate response to a veteran who is experiencing housing instability. A critical component of SSVF is something called Temporary Financial Assistance, or TFA. And this consists of flexible, time-limited payments for helping these veterans pay for housing or for other housing-related costs. And so previous work has shown that this uh, TFA really leads to a higher likelihood of being stably housed at the time of exiting the program. And that typically takes about uh, 60 to 90 days of program enrollment. Um, but long-term impact of this hasn't been studied. And this is partly because uh, of the difficulties in collecting long-term outcomes of housing status. And so on the next slide, I'll kind of outline the, uh, the objective of the study. So we, we wanted to look at that long-term impact. So going beyond kind of the rapid response and the immediate short-term outcomes, does temporary financial assistance extend to improving long-term housing outcomes as well? So on the next slide, I'll go through some of the methods of this. And so, like I said, one of the challenges of studies like this is actually collecting housing outcomes. So we turned to a number of different data sources and one of the crucial ones was the VA electronic health record. And so from the VA EHR, we looked at a cohort of veterans who were enrolled in SSVF between fiscal years 2016 to 2018. It was about 35,000 patients. And we collected from the EHR uh, baseline covariates like demographics and comorbidities. We also used the EHR to look for housing status. And in the specific, we looked in free text clinical narratives. So these are like physician progress notes or social worker notes that document the patient's care and can also talk about their housing status. And we used natural language processing system that we had developed for this purpose. And this NLP system identified mentions of housing status and notes. And we used that to derive a longitudinal variable of, of, of a binary unstable versus stable housing. And we looked at this for three years um, after a cohort of veterans had enrolled in SSVF. And the goal here was to compare over those three years, the difference between patients who receive and don't receive TFA. So on the next slide, um, this will show the main findings of the primary analysis. So among the entire cohort, we see in the orange on this, uh, on this graph over on the right, uh, this really sharp reduction in housing instability after they enter the program and receive TFA. And so after about like 90 or 120 days or so, there's been a really rapid drop. But after that, there starts to be a little bit of an uptick as some of those people who had previously found stable housing might start experiencing housing instability again. And when you compare this to the group who was in SSVF but not receiving TFA, you see they also decreased housing instability. But it was a slower and much more steady process. Um, but after about 420 days, so a little over one year, these two groups showed pretty similar outcomes. And for the remainder of the two years of the study, um, these two groups were fairly similar. Now we can break this up in the next slide, um, looking at patients who are either homeless at the time they entered the program versus who are at risk of becoming homeless. So rapid rehousing patients, that's where we saw the largest effect. And so we saw, again, that really sharp decrease in TFA compared to no TFA, um, followed by after about a year and a half, uh, similar outcomes. And homelessness prevention, so these patients, there was less of a dramatic effect um, and it was more short lasting. But we did see in the no TFA group that some of these patients actually increased in housing instability. And so this could suggest that TFA is uh, potentially, you know, acting as a protective measure for these patients and they actually saw some, uh, some deterioration in their housing instability after entering. And so in the last slide, in the next slide, I'll kind of summarize some of the findings of this. So similar to previous results, we see that TFA really is effective at improving short-term housing outcomes. Um, and, it's, and one of the contributions of the studies that we could see the timing of this was really rapid, um, you know, this very sharp and sudden decrease. But we also see that that starts to wear off after a little while. And so the effect attenuates after about three months and after about a year or so, there's really not too much of a difference between patients who receive TFA and those who received other services in, in SSVF. 
And so a response to this could be combining these rapid rehousing services through SSVF with other services like shallow subsidies. This is sort of like an extension to TFA that we're starting to look at that is longer lasting and more flexible. Or combining SSVF with permanent supportive housing programs like HUD Bash and other large VA program. And so with that, thank you for being here and I look forward to any discussion. Great, thank you all. Um, we have a lot of really interesting, almost technical questions from the audience that I'm not gonna be able to get to. I'm going to try to step back uh, given the uh, limited time that we have for Q&A. Uh, I do wanna ask, I'm gonna start Katie with you. When you describe sort of the complexity of this initiative, at the outset of this event, I said that a lot of health systems are trying to figure out what to do in housing. You're an entire state with one agency trying to figure out what to do and you're running into those levels of complexity. I just wonder it, your reflections on what came out of your work for a health system uh, that's trying to do something in this area. Does it, are you daunted by it? Do you think it's overcomable? Uh, curious your thoughts. Thank you. That's a great question and something we've we've kind of heard before. I think um, there's definitely opportunities to do something similar, but at, at a smaller scale to get started with. And I think there's definitely lessons from you know, this more expansive programs that can be adapted to uh, a health system, for example. So some of our other work studying the program has really highlighted the need for some of the, the upfront funding to get the, these kinds of partnerships and, and infrastructure um, needed to really uh, stand up and, and sustain programs like these um, and really need um, more of like the technical infrastructure as well um, as, as several of our uh, colleagues have touched on kind of the the technical infrastructure that's needed to uh, make referrals to different sectors and, and make sure that those needs are met. And so I think there's definitely complexities, but but something that is is definitely possible. Well, that relates then to sort of a broader question I want to uh, reflect on between the pretty powerful findings, Mary Catherine, from your piece, but uh, Alec, you're uh, showing that the effects fade fairly quickly of the temporary assistance um, how do we think about uh, the duration of support necessary to have an effect, a lasting effect, and the ability of the health sector, whether it's through an individual system, uh, a, a, a Medicaid program, the VA program, the ability of the health sector to sort of take on what, what we know is a, a, a longstanding, complex, multidimensional problem. So it's fairly a fairly broad question, but I'd love your thoughts on how do we think about aligning duration, supporting patients, and program uh, capacity and design? Mary Catherine, you want to start on that? Yeah, I'd love to. You know, one of the things that our program does is it works in partnership with community-based organizations, state-based and city-based entities. And that's not only for the patients we don't use housing advocate support, internal housing advocate support for, but we have a relationship with the Department of Temporary or Transitional Assistance. We have relationships with community organizing and other housing advocates in the city and specific programs that provide services for homeless elders, for example. So our goal is if there's someone else out there who will help this patient, then we articulate the need, we connect the patient and we provide the stuff that only the healthcare sector can, right? Like physician support for reasonable accommodations, communication with the social worker. And then for patients for whom there isn't a good solution or they're not able to engage with that solution for a variety of reasons, our housing advocates are really good at building that trusting relationship and doing it in a company-based model with a patient who needs it. Um, our goal in terms of working on housing is really to look for housing solutions that are permanently sustainable with the income the patient has. Now that means we're really looking at patients who have some income, right? There are patients who have no income and we don't have a bridge to a permanent housing solution for them. But I think, you know, healthcare has specific things we can bring to the table in terms of the clinical expertise, the identification of these needs. And one of the things our partners tell us is we are finding patients who don't show up in the places where other supports are available and our housing supervisor does a great job of linking patients who can be linked and putting patients on caseloads of our own housing advocates who really can't be linked to another system or who need this done in partnership with their clinical team, their behavioral health team, or someone else. That's great. Uh, thoughts from either Alec or Katie? 
Yeah, I mean, Mary Catherine talked on just a lot of really great points. And one that she brought up is, you know, the importance of kind of working with the community. And I think that's been really crucial to SSVF's uh, success because SSVF in particular works with kind of local community organizations rather than just working through like VA health clinics directly. And so I think, yeah, it takes, you know, a village to address these big structural issues. And so integrating as many people as possible. I think also, you know, just kind of being able to measure and follow. And that's, you know, kind of a unique challenge that when you're getting a lot of services, it's easy to fall through the cracks. It's easy to not, you know, kind of receive the follow-up that you need. And so improving that and improving the visibility around that, I think is important. Definitely agree. I think the only thing I would add from the, the North Carolina perspective is the program has really emphasized this no wrong door approach where uh, folks can kind of get connected to the program either from their health provider or care manager, but also through a CBO referral, through a self-referral. And so really trying to uh, make links uh, to the healthcare system and, and to that program, even if someone is is not currently accessing care. So trying to trying to get that as, as wide as possible. Well, I hate to cut this off, but we have a lot of papers. Um, but I really appreciate uh, the the range of interventions you all uh, presented, and this notion that, of course, this these problems are bigger than healthcare can solve, but there are distinct roles that distinct elements of the health system can play that are unique, that are that have an effect, that are meaningful, and are definitely worth doing. And uh, we need some humility, but we also need to not be uh, sort of uh, uh, stymied in our efforts by the notion that the problem is so large that we can't solve it. I, there were a number of questions from the audience about why are we bothering? And I think you all gave a, a good answer to uh, both the limitations, but also the potential. So I appreciate that. Thank you all. And I'm now going to uh, move us to our third panel, the so big panel. Uh, I have six, uh, we have six papers in this issue, all that focus on uh, the topic of homelessness or housing instability. Uh, it's a, it is a critical dimension of the relationship between housing and health. Uh, it is, uh, has some similarities, but also some real differences from some of the topics we've been discussing. So we thought it was important to give it its own panel that's going to cover a lot of different topics, and then we'll try to bring some of it together uh, toward the end. I'm going to introduce our uh, panelists, and, and then uh, we'll turn to them sequentially to present. Uh, Cheyenne, uh, Cheyenne Garcia from the University of California, San Francisco, who's going to present uh, the overview paper on homelessness in this issue. Matthew Fowle from the University of Pennsylvania uh, around uh, mortality uh, among the homeless population. W. David Bradford at the University of Georgia looking at another dimension of uh, mortality, particularly drug and alcohol related. Uh, Michael Mayer at the Boston Medical Center talking about clearing uh, uh, homeless encampments and uh, the perspectives of residents when that occurred. Uh, Devlin Hansen from the uh, Urban Institute uh, talking about the effects of, of the housing first approach on uh, psychiatric care. And Hannah, Hannah Decker from uh, UC San Francisco looking at uh, cancer outcomes for uh, unhoused veterans. So many different topics, but all dimension, important dimensions of, of uh, the effects and the relationship between homelessness and health. Uh, Cheyenne, I'll turn over first to you. Hello, everyone. I'm Cheyenne. Uh, I am a researcher at UCSF, the Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative. And today I am going to discuss our overview of homelessness and health. Next slide. So the first thing to know is that poor health and homelessness are bi-directionally associated with one another, which means that poor health increases an individual's risk of experiencing homelessness and homelessness worsens people's health. And so this is shown in a variety of ways. Poor health um, can increase a person's risk of homelessness through direct and indirect mechanisms. For instance, poor physical health can interfere with occupational attainment and medical debt has been shown to deplete people's savings. Mental health and substance use disorders interfered not only with occupational attainment, they also worsen social relationships and can lead to involvement with the criminal justice system, both of which increase an individual's risk of experiencing homelessness. 
Homelessness also worsens an individual's health through direct and indirect mechanisms, such as exposure to violence and unintentional injuries, and the environmental conditions of crowded shelters and exposure to the elements in unsheltered settings. Homelessness also interferes with the receipt of longitudinal health care and substance use treatment. And people experiencing homelessness have worse physical and mental health, experience accelerated aging, and have higher rates of age-adjusted mortality than those who are housed. Next slide. And healthcare systems should optimize their care for patients experiencing homelessness by employing evidence-based strategies for care. And providers should identify community resources in order to provide appropriate referrals for their patients experiencing homelessness. In our paper, we highlight four evidence-based practices. The first is really based on expert opinion. We recommend the use of low barrier care. This is a flexible care model specifically for patients experiencing homelessness that can be characterized by flexible scheduling, simple medication regimens, um, and also being able to use trauma-informed care. Second is an evidence-based intervention called critical time interventions. These are stepped time-limited interventions for those who are exiting institutional settings, and their aim is really to prevent homelessness in this uh, vulnerable population. The third is social needs screening, which is screening that providers can do for social determinants of health. That can include housing insecurity and homelessness. And it's really done in order to do two things. First, tailor medical care, and second, to connect individuals to their community resources. Finally, we recommend the evidence-based practice of medical respite, also called recuperative care. And those are really 24 seven shelters with meals and basic medical care and social services that are available to people who are experiencing homelessness who are discharged from the hospital because they no longer meet criteria for hospitalization, but they're too sick to be discharged to the streets. Next slide. And the most important takeaway of the talk, I think, is that the solution to homelessness really does lie outside of the healthcare system. Ending homelessness requires that we invest in evidence-based solutions that can be supported by the healthcare system. And the gold standard evidence-based practice to end homelessness is housing first. Housing first is both a principal and a flexible housing model that provides housing without the requirement of sobriety or employment. It's most often implemented as permanent supportive housing, which is subsidized housing with voluntary supportive services. And multiple randomized control trials across the US, Canada, Europe have shown that permanent supportive housing successfully houses people with chronic homelessness and substance use or mental health problems. Next slide. With this evidence in mind, we present several policy recommendations. The first is we recommend an increased use of Medicaid to fund housing related services. And the mechanism through which this can be done is the Medicaid Section 1115 waivers. So several states, as you heard a little bit earlier, North Carolina is one of them, California, Oregon, and Arizona are other states that have received these waivers to provide Medicaid coverage for housing adjacent services, such as housing navigation, case management, and funds for moving costs. And several states have received these waivers to improve care for those transitioning from institutional settings. For instance, Arizona uses an 1115 waiver to fund Medicaid coverage for individuals before prison discharge, and Illinois has applied to do the same. Oregon uses Medicaid funding to pay for transitional housing after institutional care. Ne uh, if you could go forward, thank you. Next, we recommend increasing the availability of permanent supportive housing, which again is subsidized housing with voluntary supportive services. And healthcare systems really have an important role to play by providing these services, including physical and mental health care. Um, and next slide, there you go. And finally, we recommend that we increase the supply of deeply affordable housing, and this can be done through multiple mechanisms. It can be done through zoning reform, increasing the availability of housing choice vouchers, increasing the availability and flexibility of the low-income housing tax credit, and finally, enforcement of anti-discrimination laws, especially those around source of income discrimination for voucher holders. Next slide. Thank you, appreciate it. 
Wonderful. Thank you for that uh, overview and introduction to the topic with some very clear uh, recommendations. We'll turn next uh, to Matthew Fowle. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt Fowle. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania, working at the Housing Initiative at Penn. I'm really pleased to be able to present the study that Dr. Giselle Ruthia, Assistant Professor at New York University, and I conducted on the rise in mortality among people experiencing homelessness, which we ascribe to mortal systemic exclusion. By what percent has the homeless mortality rate increased over the last decade? This question has been difficult to answer because no federal agency records or collects nationwide data on mortality among people experiencing homelessness. Therefore, we built a national data set of individual level death records for people experiencing homelessness, obtained from medical examiners, coroners, sheriff's offices, and public health departments. The final data set contains information for more than 22,000 homeless decedents across 22 localities in 10 US states and the District of Columbia over a 10 year period. And I'd like to share our key findings with you. In answer to, um, back one slide, please. Uh, in answer to my opening question, we found an unprecedented 238% increase in the all cause mortality rate among people experiencing homelessness between 2011 and 2020. And this resulted in a 2020 homeless mortality rate that was three times larger than the rate for the general population. Next slide, please. What's driving this rise in mortality? Drug and alcohol overdose, cardiovascular disease, unintentional injuries, traffic injuries, suicide, and homicide are the six primary causes of death. We also found for specific mortality rates due to hot and cold exposures increased by 141%, cancers increased by 320%, and diabetes and infections increased by more than 400% each. The circumstances in which these deaths occur are tragic yet preventable. Next slide, please. Our findings present evidence of the widespread worsening of homeless mortality across the United States, particularly among the causes that are preventable with access to stable housing and appropriate healthcare. At the most fundamental level, housing provides protection against exposure to the elements and to violence. Housing also provides a stable platform that supports gaining employment and education and establishing regular access to healthcare. Without housing, it is extremely difficult to consistently engage with medical services, such as routine healthcare that can identify the onset of serious medical conditions like cancer and heart disease, or manage chronic diseases like diabetes or address mental illnesses and substance use disorders. Next slide, please. To address rapidly rising mortality, we highlight the strong need for state and federal intervention to ensure that cities and counties track standardized data on homeless mortality. There must be a nationwide database that tracks all cause and cause specific mortality rates, changes in trends over time, and our progress towards eliminating homeless deaths. The most effective form of mortality prevention is in preventing the occurrence of homelessness in the first place, and in rehousing people experiencing homelessness as quickly and stably as possible. Governments must ensure that people experiencing homelessness are systematically incorporated into the life affirming institutions of affordable housing and healthcare. 
Thank you very much for the opportunity to share the highlights of our research with you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, over to David Bradford. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to come today. I'm gonna take a slightly different tack and not use uh, uh, slides uh, to try to minimize some of the transition time. So on behalf of my co-author, Felipe Lozano Roja, I want to thank Health Affairs first for hosting this webinar to introduce various uh, papers that are in this special issue on housing and health. And, you know, we're very pleased to be able to give you an overview of our contribution, which is titled Higher Rates of Homelessness are Associated with Increases in Mortality from Accidental uh, Drug and Alcohol Poisonings. Now, you've already heard uh, wonderful introductions to this longstanding problem of housing instability in the United States, and I suspect everyone is broadly aware of the crises surrounding deaths of despair, like opioid poisoning. So I'm just going to jump right into what it is that Felipe and I were trying to understand. So the work that Felipe and I undertook examines the intersections of these two longstanding crises. Specifically, we wanted to know whether and how homelessness causally drives ongoing deaths of despair, particularly around substances, opioids, uh, and alcohol as sort of the primary uh, uh, sort of top line uh, results we'll be talking about. Now, both of these problems, housing instability and substance-related mortality, are persistent, and they show no signs of relent relenting. And there's some prior work on this in this area conducted by Ashley Bradford, who you'll be hearing uh, in the next panel, and myself that found a causal link between evictions and opioid and alcohol deaths. However, to date, there's not been a similar study to identify a link between the most extreme form of housing instability, homelessness, which we've just heard about in the last two uh, uh, papers in this panel, and the sort of mortality that leads to deaths of, that are sort of classified as deaths of despair. So that's the project that Felipe, Felipe and I undertook uh, for this paper. Now we base our study on two main data sets. They're publicly available. You can go download them yourself uh, and uh, have fun with them. Uh, the first are point in time estimates of homelessness that are constructed annually by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Now HUD has divided every community in the United States into aggregations of responsible zones for homelessness services called continuity of care units. There's about 400 or so of those in the US this year. Um, we focus our analysis uh, on the more compact uh, metropolitan con uh, continuity of care units and exclude broad geographic regions like rest of state that may be very diverse geographically and, and uh, socioeconomically. The way that these, this data is constructed is that on a single night in January every year, towards the end of January, uh, these local COCs send out an army of volunteers to count every homeless person in their regions. These are called the point in time uh, estimates or really censuses of data. And we recover that data from 2007 to 2017. It's interesting data. The difficulty with it, of course, is it's, geo, the, it's at the COC level, the definitions of which change. Sometimes counties are in one versus another. So the first step in our analysis turned out to be a crash course in constructing harmonized uh, shape files and geocoding uh, the data. But in the end, we were able to link every county in the United States to uh, the COC that they happen to be in, in each year which takes us to the second data set we used, which is much more straightforward, the CDC multiple calls of death microfiles. This is essentially an abstract from every uh, death certificate in the United States, about two million, two to three million deaths in the US each year. We extracted uh, information on deaths with any cause listed for a number of substances, uh, any opioid, prescription opioids, that is the natural and semi-synthetic opioids, synthetic opioids like fentanyl, heroin, stimulants, benzodiazepines, cocaine, and alcohol. All of that was aggregated up to the COC level. And that forms the basis of, uh, of our analysis. Now, our primary analysis is trying to understand the uh, or model the number of deaths in the, each COC for each of these categories separately of mortality uh, as a function of the primary variable of interest being the homelessness uh, homelessness rates. But as you saw in the first uh, paper of this panel, there is this concern about sort of bi-directionality in the relationship between homelessness and health outcomes like substance use disorders that lead to substance-related deaths. And we wanted to be able to say something about causality. And so we needed to have a statistical method that eliminated that potential for our feedback. 
So we used a form of instrumental variables called two-stage residual inclusion. I won't go into any of the details. If you're interested, email me. I'm happy to go on at great length about it privately. Uh, we followed the work that uh, Bradford and Bradford in 2023 and used a panel of state landlord tenant laws to predict homelessness outcomes, with the pathway being landlord tenant laws affect uh, evictions, which we've already seen, evictions affect homelessness, but those laws don't themselves have a direct impact on mortality. We do the usual tests for instrumental variables, just the, the weak tests, and a more recent contribution by Emily Oster to help us understand whether we've purged uh, omitted variables bias from the analysis and everything passed. So we're feeling confident that we at least have a basis for making causal claims about the impact of homelessness on uh, these mortalities. So once we have all of that done and we're prepared, we then run these count uh, the models of the number of deaths using sort of a bi binomial, binomial general, generalized linear model um, as a function of these, these instrumented homelessness rates. And for the Tech, techies out there, we bootstrapped the standard errors and did all the usual stuff you do in these circumstances. Now, what do we find? Um, so I'll express the, our findings in sort of percent terms so that we can compare across different kinds of substances. So what we found was that if there was a 10% increase in the overall homelessness rate, we would predict a 3.2% increase in the all opioid or any opioid mortality rate. That same 10% increase in homelessness would also be associated or predict a 5% increase in synthetic opioid deaths. That's fentanyl primarily. Um, it would uh, predict a 3.9% increase in heroin deaths and a 5.6% increase in alcohol poisonings. Now we ran a lot of models using different measures of homelessness, all homelessness, chronic homelessness, sheltered homelessness, homelessness unsheltered homelessness. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of different tables. There's a lot of parameters in the paper if you read it. Uh, all of them, however, find the same strong, very statistically significant result uh, that shows a positive relationship. More homelessness is translates into greater levels of substance, basically whichever substance we look at and whatever measure of homelessness we have. Um, if we wanted to put this in, um, in other terms, if we were to take every county in 2017, assume it was at the 75th percentile, drop it down to the median uh, of homelessness, we think we would save somewhere around 1,960 lives just from the opioid uh, deaths alone. So the upshot of all of this is that homelessness and uh, deaths of despair are tightly linked um, and making progress on progress from a policy standpoint on homelessness actually has the add-on benefit of helping us make progress on the substances, substance related mortality epidemic as well. So we hope that policymakers can take that into consideration when they're doing their internal cost benefit analyses. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Uh, done without slides, It's uh, that was <laughs> terrific. Uh, Michael, uh, over to you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I'm gonna continue the trend of presenting without slides for the sake of time here. Um, my name is Mike Mayer. I'm a medical student at Stanford and I formerly uh, worked as a housing program manager at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program and as a research assistant at Boston Medical Center. Um, I'm excited to talk to everyone about our paper today. Um, our paper is Encampment Clearings and Transitional Housing, a Qualitative Analysis of Resident Experiment, um, Experiences. Um, cities across the country, including Boston, um, have debated how best to address tent encampments, which can sometimes be sites of substance use and violence in addition to being very visible evidence of homelessness. Encampment sweeps, which is the removal of tents and dispersal of individuals who are staying there, is a common policy approach. However, modeling studies and other data suggest that these interventions lead to increased risk for overdose death and harms for people living in encampments. They're also an aggressive approach to addressing homelessness that contribute to multiple layers of dehumanization and trauma brought upon people experiencing homelessness by our social safety nets and as well as our carceral system. In 2022, the city of Boston conducted an encampment clearing paired with a novel intervention, low threshold harm reduction housing spaces for displaced um, encampment residents. These harm reduction housing sites consisted of repurposed hotels, shelters, and healthcare facilities they used a harm reduction model that provided wraparound healthcare and access to social services and offered guests significantly more autonomy um, compared to traditional emergency shelters. 
Guests were given their own rooms. They were allowed to come and go as they pleased. While many displaced encampment residents were able to access these harm reduction housing sites, unfortunately, some individuals were missed and were instead displaced to other um, unsheltered living arrangements throughout the city. So to answer the question of how tent encampment removal and harm reduction housing actually affect the health, safety, and substance use outcomes, the things that policymakers often are most concerned about, we recruited 30 participants who previously lived at the cleared encampment and conducted interviews with them. Of the 30 participants, 14 had been placed in harm reduction housing and 16 had not. Um, we found that harm reduction housing improved the health and safety concerns for nearly all admitted participants. Many of the participants felt they had made meaningful progress toward long-term stability, including achieving employment, making significant progress toward permanent housing, and initiating therapies related to chronic health conditions and addiction. These steps were largely attributed to the structure of harm reduction housing itself and the trauma-informed staff hired to support the residents. Having their own room meant participants could keep belonging safe for extended periods. It meant providers and case managers could follow up with them readily on healthcare needs, and connection to additional services. Being able to live with one's long-term partner meant participants actually enjoyed living in harm reduction housing, leading to extremely high retention and care rates. Um, being able to come and go as they needed meant people could pursue other needs related to recovery and social support without the constraints of traditional shelters. And finally, the trauma-informed staffing and the frequent checking in conducted by harm reduction specialists on site and participants felt safe and supported to pursue recovery on their own terms. For participants who were not admitted to harm reduction housing, the disruption of social ties via displacement generally exacerbated health and safety concerns that we know are already associated with unsheltered homelessness. These concerns, including assaults, loss of belongings, and exacerbation of mental health conditions, lasted well beyond participants' immediate displacements. Individuals shared that the stress induced by the encampment clearing was overwhelming. Some participants shared it made them suicidal and one shared it led them to requiring, it led them to requiring an inpatient hospitalization. Some participants shared that their substance use increased markedly after the sweep. They needed a way to cope with the stress of losing their belongings, of losing their community and losing their homes. Safety concerns were a major theme that came up in our interviews. Despite the violence that can sometimes be associated with encampment settings, participants felt that there was at least some form of order and stability in these settings, created and enforced by the community itself. The encampment clearing just fully disrupted this. The clearing led to an influx of new people to the area. Participants described these newcomers as not knowing the quote unquote rules of the space and as frequently fighting for territory or social status in the area. The clearing also disrupted social networks that many felt were crucial for their day-to-day -day survival. This disruption was especially significant um, for women and gender oppressed individuals who frequently cited friends and neighbors as being crucial to their safety during the night while living on the streets. Um, though um, health and safety concerns and encampments were acknowledged by all participants, encampments were consistently raised as a better alternative to traditional emergency shelters suggesting a dire need for improvements to our shelter models and other structured service environments. Namely, the shelters were frequently described as environments that limited autonomy, limited privacy, and created difficult social interactions between both guests and staff. They were described as traumatizing for people living with multifaceted trauma, especially people with incarceration histories. In some cases, shelters were fundamentally inaccessible for people, for example, for people with long-term partners or people with addiction to fentanyl. Our findings suggest first that encampment clearings or sweeps as they exist today are both ineffective in improving health and safety concerns for encampment residents and are traumatizing and dehumanizing for people living through these clearings. Sudden disruption of encampment communities is unlikely to be helpful, is unlikely to be a helpful intervention and may instead heighten health and safety risks for people living in the neighborhood. Instead, we recommend a gradual intervention that provides low threshold harm reduction, shelter and housing access and that allows residents to enter shelter and housing on their own terms and on their own timelines. Our findings also suggest that low threshold harm reduction housing is an effective model for improving health and safety outcomes for people in encampment settings, suggesting improvements that could be made to traditional emergency shelters. Many participants shared that they had found part-time employment and were already excited to expand this. And this was only weeks or months after moving from an encampment setting. The harm reduction housing model we investigated was particularly successful 
due to its structural protection of autonomy and privacy for guests, its on-site access to services, and its trauma-informed non-judgmental staff, changes to traditional shelters that promote autonomy, privacy, stability in the form of a consistent bed, access to adequate storage spaces, and hiring of trauma-informed staffing, especially peer specialists, are likely to make shelters more accessible for people with addiction and people who otherwise would be forced to live in encampments. Finally, our findings suggest that in lieu of structural change to traditional emergency shelters and large-scale investment in harm reduction transitional housing models that work, other interventions such as outreach-based care and safe injection sites may be able to mimic the benefits of encampment living without the associated risks. And um, that's all I'll share for today, but thank you so much. Great, thank you so much uh, for that presentation. Uh, we'll turn now to uh, Devlin Hansen. Hi, um, my name is Devlin Hansen and I'm an economist with the Urban Institute. Together with my co-author, Sarah Gillespie, we wrote the article, Housing First, Increased Psychiatric Care Office Visits and Prescriptions While Reducing Emergency Visits. Next slide. Homelessness remains an urgent public health concern, particularly for people who endure chronic homelessness and have high rates of mental health and substance use disorders. In 2022, federal data showed the highest total number of people experiencing homelessness and the highest number of people experiencing chronic homelessness since data collection began in 2007. Evidence has been mounting on the effectiveness of permanent supportive housing for outcomes such as housing retention and reductions in jail time, but rigorous evidence on its impacts on healthcare use has been mixed. Housing First is an approach to ending homelessness that recognizes housing as a platform for stability and engagement in health services. Next slide. In 2016, the city and county of Denver, Colorado launched the Denver Supportive Housing Social Impact Bond Initiative, a supportive housing intervention designed to serve a chronically homeless population that had frequent arrests and jail stays. The project provided 250 project-based or scattered site vouchers. The program was implemented using a Housing First model. Consistent with the Housing First model, those in the program were not subject to any conditions of participation to be eligible for or receive permanent supportive housing through the Denver SIB. People in the intervention group who received housing were <clears throat> housed in either a scattered site unit rented with a housing subsidy in the private rental market or a single site building fully dedicated to supportive housing units. Supportive housing providers used a modified assertive community treatment or ACT model under which participants received comprehensive care from multidisciplinary teams. Other core components of the ACT model are small shared caseloads among all ACT team providers and delivery of nursing and psychiatric services in participants' home with no time limits on service eligibility. Next slide. To measure the impact of the Denver Supportive Housing Program, we implemented a randomized controlled trial. Specifically, we randomized 724 individuals on a rolling basis from 2016 to 2017. Those assigned to the intervention were referred to the housing providers to receive supportive housing. Those randomized to the control group received services as usual in the community. Two of the outcomes we looked at, healthcare utilization and Medicaid enrollment were measured with administrative data from Medicaid and the third outcome mortality was measured using, using vital statistics data. Next slide. In all of our analysis, we ran regressions which controlled for pre-randomization characteristics. Although we do not see any statistically significant differences in office-based care visits, overall we do see eight more office-based care visits with a primary psychiatric diagnosis. On average, the intervention group had eight more office-based care visits compared to the control group in the two years after randomization. Next slide. We also found that the intervention had significant impacts on emergency department visits, the number of medications that were prescribed, as well as the number of other services that were received. We find that the intervention group had six fewer emergency department visits than the control group, in the two years after randomization. The intervention group also had three more prescription medications prescribed and 12 more other services in the control group in the two years after randomization. We found no significant difference in the number of ambulance trips between the two groups. Next slide. When looking at the share of individuals who had any visit with a specific diagnosis, we found that the intervention had a significant impact 
on the share of individuals who received any service with a mental health diagnosis. Specifically, we found that those in the intervention group were 34 percentage points more likely to receive any service with a mental health diagnosis compared to the control group in the two years post-randomization. This is particularly true for diagnoses related to anxiety, psychotic disorders, and PTSD. We found no significant differences in receiving services with a substance use diagnosis or a physical health diagnosis. Next slide. We found that those in the intervention group were actually less likely to be enrolled in Medicaid in the two years post-randomization compared to the control group. Although the share of individuals enrolled in Medicaid rose over time for both the intervention and control group, the intervention group was five percentage points less likely to be enrolled in Medicaid compared to the control group in the two years post-randomization. This translates to on average one last month being enrolled in Medicaid for the intervention group compared to the control group. When we look at whether they received any services, we do not see any statistically significant difference between the intervention and control group. We also looked at the impact of the program on mortality and found that there was no statistically significant difference between the intervention and control group. Next slide. Our study shows that supportive permanent housing and specifically a housing first model impact healthcare use by reducing emergency department visits and increasing office-based care visits with psychiatric diagnoses, as well as medications. Even though Housing First does not require participation in services, healthcare use was higher in this group than in usual care in terms of office-based care visits with psychiatric diagnoses. Not only is permanent supportive housing a housing intervention, but it is an, also an intervention that facilitates healthcare services for people with many healthcare needs. Policymakers should consider the impact on healthcare use when considering pathways to scale permanent supportive housing. Next slide. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And our last uh, presentation in this uh, panel is uh, Hannah Decker. Hannah, over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Decker, and I'm a general surgeon in training at UCSF, working with the Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to share a little bit with you all about what we found in our article, Changes in Housing Status Are Associated with Cancer Outcomes in U.S. Veterans. Now, to give some very brief background, the homeless population in the U.S. is aging. Nearly half of single unhoused adults are over 50 years old, which is the age when cancer incidence increases, and national guidelines recommend screening for certain cancers. In fact, as we've heard today, cancer is a leading cause of death in unhoused adults. And there is evidence um, that unhoused patients have higher risks of death than housed patients following cancer diagnosis. But we don't really know how this maps to changes in housing status. For example, if an unhoused person gains housing after diagnosis with cancer, does that change their survival? To answer this question, we examined over 100,000 veterans diagnosed with lung, colorectal, or breast cancer from 2011 to 2020 who received care at the VA. At the time of diagnosis, 95% were housed, and 1% of these veterans lost their housing in the year after diagnosis. 5% of our total cohort were unhoused. Just over 20% of these veterans actually gained housing in the year after diagnosis. So this left us with four major groups continuously housed, continuously unhoused, those who, those who gained housing, and those who lost housing. And we were able to really carefully assess housing status each month for the year before and the year after cancer diagnosis, because the VA does a really thorough job, as we've heard from other presenters, of systematically documenting housing status. So we use clinic reminders, diagnosis codes, and other screening information from the medical record, which helps us really get a fine-tuned assessment of how not, not just housing status, but housing status changes around the time of diagnosis. Next slide, please. Again, our main research question was, are changes in housing status after cancer diagnosis associated with survival? And what we found is yes. When compared to continuously housed veterans, both continuously unhoused veterans and veterans who lost their housing after diagnosis had worse overall survival uh, after diagnosis with lung and colorectal cancer. And this was true even after adjusting for variables that were different between the two groups, um, between the groups, including stage of diagnosis and other demographic variables. Continuously unhoused veterans 
had between a 9 and 22 percent higher risk of death, and veterans who lost their housing after diagnosis had between an 18 and 29 percent higher risk of death than continuously housed veterans. But the group of veterans who were unhoused at the time of diagnosis but gained housing in the year afterwards actually had no difference in survival from housed patients. And this suggests to us that gaining housing after cancer diagnosis is associated with a survival benefit. Now, this study does have some limitations. Um, most significantly, we were only able to study veterans who are enrolled to receive care from the VA. And because the VA provides universal health care to its beneficiaries, this setting effectively eliminates insurance access as an issue for unhoused patients. This means that our analysis likely underestimates the association between homelessness and poor health outcomes after cancer diagnosis. Next slide, please. So thinking about the implications of this, um, what we found is that housing is associated with a survival benefit compared to remaining homeless after cancer diagnosis. And there are several potential mechanisms for why this might be the case. First, stable housing might help patients alter health-related behaviors that might contribute to improved overall cancer outcomes. Stable housing might facilitate uh, coordination of complex cancer care by reducing things like competing priorities, vulnerability to external forces, and by improving access to consistent communication and schedule of outpatient care. And this might improve outcomes. And then finally, gaining housing in the setting is likely also a surrogate measure for additional supportive care, including caregivers, social support, access to transportation, and support for appointments, um, which veterans can get through the VA. But in sum, our research suggests that policies to promote housing and prevent homelessness might improve cancer-related outcomes. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, thanks to all of you for uh, just an incredible collection of research. Obviously, you uh, touched on very different dimensions of the issue, and so uh, there's not sort of a single thread, but I am, uh, I do want to return, Cheyenne, to where you started with a sort of unabashed call for Housing First. And um, as I listen to presentation after presentation showing health effects associated with homeless effects associated with homeless with 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 homelessness and improvements uh, uh, with obtaining housing it does seem that if you're sitting over on the health side of the world I don't know how many of you count yourself as housing experts but I do not um, if you would say uh, if you're sitting in the health part of the world uh, housing first is is the place to begin and so I'd be curious if others agree with that sentiment and if so, how far away it seems to me we are from that as sort of the general attitude towards housing and some comments on what the health sector's role is in trying to uh, bring about a, a, some of the changes that might be uh, important to improve people's health. I, health. I know it's a very broad question, but be interested in additional thoughts on this. Hannah, go ahead. I'd love to jump in. Thanks so much for the question. I think that what, what one thing that we found particularly striking in our in our research is that over 20% of unhoused veterans with a cancer diagnosis gained housing in the year after diagnosis in the VA. And so to your question about how close we are to, to adopting housing first principles and actually promoting housing for patients, I think that the VA is one system to really look to. And I know we've heard from other presenters um, referencing um, projects and programs from the VA that, that really support unhoused veterans, but, you know, that they've made um, addressing homelessness a federal priority since 2009, and that their, all of their efforts have resulted in a 45% reduction in the, rate, in the rates of homeless veterans. And so I think that one thing that gives me a lot of hope in doing this research is looking to health systems that are doing some things really right. Um, and I'm not saying that there isn't room to adapt and grow, but I think that's particularly interesting. And, and you can see, you know, in, in our research, the, the real ben health benefit likely of those, um, of that focus and of the work that they've been doing. Other thoughts on this? I, I, I am struck, yeah, go ahead, Michael. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say our, our investigation was 
quite a, as close as you can get to a housing first model um, and was just absolutely um, shocked by how effective the intervention was, even as somebody who's worked in the um, housing space for several years. Um, like I've said in uh, uh, the podcast uh, that we've done, um, I have a natural skepticism of novel interventions, but um, you know, for people who have been living in an encampment setting, struggling with serious addiction, moving into housing, and then within a matter of weeks are looking at part-time employment, making serious progress on um, housing applications. It's just remarkable. So 100% housing is it has to be step one. And it, yeah. I could just uh, uh, jump in quickly and say, you know, there uh, there's a lot of uh, movement among the accountable care organizations in this country to have sort of a broad view of what healthcare provision is. And they're investing in things like educational opportunities and in housing. And I think one of the lessons that we take from all of the work that was presented in this panel is that to the extent that those organizations do invest in housing, it actually is saving them in expenses on a variety of healthcare uh, healthcare costs that they could then reallocate to other urgent needs. And so there is an opportunity for a, a sort of real economies to be to be had here with the with with complementarity in the investment. Uh, Michael, I'm glad you mentioned the podcast. I was going to uh, too. We had a nice conversation about your paper. And one of the things I was struck by in, in our discussion is that there, there is such an outside inside difference here that, that from the city's perspective, they're looking at a tent encampment and they see uh, blight and disadvantage and, and drug uh, use and, and not that there aren't real uh, harms to, to living that way relative to other circumstances, but there are also just tremendous benefits from being in a, a community. Uh, that are probably completely invisible to people outside. And, and Hannah, I was just thinking in re your response, part of what the, the political motivation is a defined population that people can, can relate to. So I'm wondering if, uh, again, just sort of thinking about the, 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 the ways in which we can begin to think differently about this issue and the population and, and the needs of the population, they feel very different in a setting like this than they do in sort of the general uh, media is a common enough problem. Uh, I don't know if uh, others have thoughts about that. Um, I, I am um, uh, moving maybe a little bit away from, from politics. Um, we did hear in earlier panels about the role of, uh, of, of housing and neighborhood quality. And one of the questions I've had throughout all of our work on this issue is that uh, we do have the six of you looking at homelessness. And the, the last panel will look some at housing quality and affordability. But to what degree are we looking at one, uh, at, are, are, are we looking at separate issues, community, neighborhood, housing quality, and homelessness? Or are they really one issue? And the degree to which, again, in the work that you've done, you feel like these are sort of two ends of the same spectrum or, or is, is being unhoused sort of a, a, a a qualitatively different status that requires a qualitatively different set of interventions. Anyone have a thought on? I think uh, something that comes to mind when you ask that is um, that homelessness is really something that's time varying. It's not as though someone is like homeless and then they stay homeless for years and years. For many people, it's a brief experience and cycling between this insecure housing or kind of housing that might be suboptimal, I guess, for many health outcomes is something that I think people will go through across their life course um, if they experience homelessness. And it really is, I think, um, on a spectrum that I feel is very related to one another. I appreciate you raising that. Actually, uh, the narrative matters piece in this issue, which is a first person narrative, is by a person who had that experience and is not in that status anymore and talks about uh, what it took to make the change and the implications of that uh, on their life. It's a very powerful piece. So very important to see this as a continuum. Can I add to that? Please. Yeah, I certainly agree uh, with Cheyenne that it, it's very much, it very much lies on a continuum. You know, any efforts to improve housing quality, to make somebody less housing insecure is going to have effects on homelessness, reducing the chance that they experience homelessness in the first place. Um, but also say, just going back to the first question you asked about 
what healthcare providers can do. I don't think it should necessarily be the job of healthcare institutions to provide housing. And I don't think solely private actors and organizations can solve our problem of the shortage of affordable housing. Um, it's, it's a state and federal problem ultimately. And I think that it has to be massive federal investment in affordable housing. I think also in social housing, which uh, we haven't discussed uh, very much. And I'd also just add with regard to kind of the interventions that we're implementing uh, that we know are uh, evidence-based like permanent supportive housing, we have uh, growing levels of chronic homelessness in rural areas where um, we don't have the same quality of housing, we don't have the same availability of supportive services. So I think it's important that we also think beyond uh, major cities and how these interventions are being implemented elsewhere. Uh, Hannah, you mentioned uh, in studying cancer, the uh, aging uh, population of, of people experiencing housing. We did get a question in from the audience earlier about just sort of in general, as people are looking at housing interventions, uh, whether um, an older population is a focus, again, sort of the, 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 the media stereotype, which you tend to observe is, is uh, tends, tends to be younger. Uh, do any of you have in any of the work uh, Hannah, you mentioned it explicitly, but if any of the others of you um, disaggregated some of the data by age and whether you see different phenomena, different experiences um, along that spectrum? I can start. We didn't disaggregate our data by age, but what, one thing that we did find, which I did think was interesting, um, and I think warrants further you know, investigation, in our study is that the group of unhoused veterans who were unhoused at the time of cancer diagnosis actually were diagnosed at a younger age than the housed, um, their housed counterparts by about five years younger. Um, the housed veterans had an average age at diagnosis of about 68, whereas the unhoused about 63 years old. And so I think it that highlights some questions for me in terms of the impacts of um, housing instability and homelessness on people's health that might have might have impacts even down to the cellular level beyond thinking about just things like access to care and all the important things that we're talking about here, but weather, chronic weathering and the chronic stress and how that might um, play in. So I think that the aging of the unhoused population is certainly an important issue and it might, you know, show up in a variety of different ways when we're looking at um, diseases that we think are more commonly confined to older adults. David, in the uh, some of the trend analysis you presented, uh, anything stand out there? Well, you know, it's it's interesting. I, I was going to chime in and say we didn't study that question. However, this is this is data, the point in time estimates from the uh, continuum of care units and the obviously the death certificate data does in fact have measures across the age gradient and veteran status and so anybody listening uh into the webinar uh there's a ripe uh, area for research future research to be done so i i hope someone picks up the mantle yeah and i'll ask the same of matt and at the same time um a question came in from the audience you referenced social housing a term that maybe not everyone is uh, familiar with. So if you could say a little bit about that, but I am curious also you presented uh, data on increases in mortality. And I just wondered if there was an age dimension to that. Yeah, that's something uh, we didn't specifically analyze. Um, but when you look at kind of the average age of death, it ranges, I think the average is around 50 to 52, which is 20 years younger uh, or more uh, than the average life expectancy uh, in the US. So, you know, many of the um, the medical conditions that people are facing, uh, like diabetes, like cancers, are occurring 20 plus years earlier than they would among the general population. Um, to the question about social housing, uh, by that I mean housing that is permanently affordable um, and often is owned publicly, whether that's uh, via uh, various public corporations or the government itself or nonprofits, um, people have a stake in that housing and can live there for the long term at an affordable rate. 
I do have to note uh, in your first response that 20 year gap is not terribly different than the gap we saw in the first panel about the life expectancy in different neighborhoods within the same city. So uh, if we needed any uh, more evidence, which I don't think we do, about the critical role of living circumstances uh, in health and life, uh, it, it, and, and maybe in partial answer to the question of whether uh, being unhoused is, is part of a continuum, we see housing effects for people who are fully housed. We see life expectancy effects for people who are fully housed, depending on where they live as well. So very uh, different mechanics, different dimensions, but all playing out here. Well, uh, thank you all. I know it was a lot to cover in one panel, but I think the breadth was a strength of the panel to show the critical multiple relationships and uh, the importance to the healthcare sector of viewing uh, people without housing at all as at very elevated risk of uh, mortality and morbidity. Um, and as we saw earlier today, um, some opportunities for the sector to intervene um, at the health level as well as at the housing level as discussed here. So appreciate the presentations here and the papers and encourage our audience to look at the, uh, the papers in full after the event. We're now going to turn to our final panel. I know it's been a, a long uh, afternoon for those of us in the East, but it uh, we do have one more panel that, that that brings together some of the themes already that we've been discussing here. I will uh, once again introduce them uh, in advance so that we can hear their presentations, but they are going to speak on a range of issues that address housing cost, uh, quality, and stability. We'll hear from Sandra Newman, a professor of policy studies at Johns Hopkins uh, University, uh, Daniel Neal, associate professor of computer science and public service at uh, New York University, um, Ashley Bradford, at the, uh, an assistant professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology, uh, and Diana Hernandez, associate professor of sociomedical uh, sciences um, at Columbia. And uh, I will turn first uh, to Sandy. Great. Thanks very much. Um, let's see, I'm getting some messages. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Um, hello to everyone. Um, the paper, the article that I'll be talking about, uh, has three wonderful co-authors, my colleague Tama Leventhal from Tufts University, uh, my colleague Scott Halupka from Johns Hopkins, and uh, Faye Tan, who is an ABD at Tufts. Um, let's move to the next slide. So I'm going to be talking about a housing voucher experiment. And uh, I don't know whether uh, everyone in the audience is uh, an expert about the housing voucher program. It's one of uh, the assisted housing programs uh, administered by uh, HUD. And um, it actually is the largest of those programs. It currently costs about $30 billion. Uh, it helps about 2 million households, about two thirds of them are families. Uh, what's distinct about the voucher program is that uh, by contrast to traditional public housing, people think about assisted housing, they think about projects or developments or buildings. Uh, here, the tenant uh, essentially is given a rent stamp and is enabled to operate as, as if they are in the private market. That is, they go out and they search for uh, a decent unit of housing and they don't have to live in a particular development. Uh, the tenant pays uh, a maximum of 30% of their income for rent, and then the government pays the rest. There are three requirements of the program. Uh, first of all, uh, the housing needs to meet quality standards. Uh, so these units are inspected. Uh, generally, private market units are not inspected on any regular basis. Uh, the rent is just a bit below the median rent for the metropolitan area, it's about 40 the 40th percentile, and the tenant income has to fall below 50% uh, of the area median. So unlike other safety net programs like Medicaid or SNAP, uh, housing assistance does not use the federal poverty line to define income eligibility. Next slide. So the study I'm talking about, uh, we've titled Housing and Children's Healthy Development. Uh, I have to emphasize this is the first randomized control trial of housing vouchers. And um, 
this is a really an important element because because this is such an important program. Uh, we know that uh, generally uh, experiments or RCTs are really the gold standard of scientific method. They are rare uh, in social policy and the social sciences. And um, what makes them uh, sort of a standout is that we can uh, infer causality, not just associations or correlations. So an important advance. Um, SPINS housing assistant and the voucher program in particular is not an entitlement. So again, a difference from safety net programs. Uh, we have only about 25% of the income eligibles who actually receive assistance. And this gives an opportunity to uh, actually do a random assignment uh, so that uh, families get onto a waiting list for a voucher and the public housing authority that administers the voucher program uh, can, can randomly assign uh, families to those who uh, will be offered a voucher they are the winners of the lottery and those who will not be offered a voucher or uh, the unfortunate losers of the lottery. Um, the sample for this study uh, are families with at least one child who was between the ages of three and 10 at baseline. Uh, the baseline interview was conducted in 2017, 2018, so pre-pandemic. Uh, and uh, that interview was conducted in person with a uh, very intensive interview uh, observations and assessments, including various physical assessments. Uh, we then uh, uh, recontacted our sample and interviewed them in 2020, 2021. And as those dates uh, I hope are meaningful to you, that was during the pandemic and no researchers were allowed to go out and interview their samples. So we had to talk to them on the telephone. Next slide. So the question that we ask in this particular uh, study, and this is really the very first uh, 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 sort of evidence that we're putting forward from the study, is does the voucher reduce family stress? Um, I might note that family stress is a construct in the developmental psychology world. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer here because most of our families are headed by mothers and mother is the primary caregiver for the child. So we're really talking about stress experienced by the mother. Next slide. Okay, so <clears throat> the voucher, what is a voucher? It's really a black box. And um, we wanna know what characteristics of the voucher actually have an effect, if any do have an effect, because it's only when we unpack the voucher that we uh, actually look at mechanisms and those aspects of the policy uh, that actually uh, uh, we might need to uh, adjust. If we are just looking at the voucher in general, it's, it's sort of too much of a sort of vague uh, totality. And so the first uh, feature we looked at was affordability. Uh, we used the HUD rule of uh, paying no more than 30% of your income to rent as the measure of affordability got great external validity there, uh, that the unit had to be de decent, safe, and sanitary, and that the environment needed to be suitable. All of these uh, unpacked elements are uh, included in federal legislation and statutes, and so we are specifically looking at what the voucher itself is supposed to achieve. In terms of findings, uh, the first finding is that the voucher overall reduced uh, two different aspects of uh, family stress or of mother's stress. Uh, the first is hypertension or high blood pressure, and the second is parent stress. And this is sort of grappling with the challenges of uh, being a parent. The second finding is enabled by our having unpacked the voucher. And of the three characteristics, we found that the affordability uh, aspect of the voucher really played the greatest role. Uh, it was the mechanism for uh, reducing parent stress. Uh, we also found that uh, safety uh, in the neighborhood during the daytime, which allows kids to walk to school, uh, mothers to uh, conduct uh, routines in the neighborhood, uh, that that too played a part, but it was considerably weaker than 
uh, uh, than the affordability feature. Next slide. So if we plot uh, the affordability feature on the x-axis along the bottom horizontal and a score on the parenting scale uh, along the y-axis, so each is going from the lowest level as you move up or as you move to the right to the higher level, um, a sort of miraculous finding that the sweet spot is really just at about that 30% uh, rule that HUD uses. Uh, beyond that, uh, you move into higher stress. Below that, you also move into higher stress. Um, and that is likely because we're talking about very low income families and those who are spending much less than 30% uh, are not uh, able to access uh, very good housing or neighborhoods. So um, moving forward, I hope everyone will stay tuned because we are planning to conduct a third wave in person uh, to see how our families are doing. And we will particularly be interested in children's and mothers' mental and physical health. So thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Daniel, over to you. All right, well, thanks so much. Uh, can I have a slide, please? Yep, great. So, uh, so this is joint work uh, with my uh, amazing co-authors um, and a really exciting interdisciplinary collaboration between computer science, data science, health policy, and housing policy. So, um, yep, thank you. Um, so, uh, I'd like to acknowledge our funder, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, as well as uh, New York State Department of Health for. Um, for supplying data, um, all the usual disclaimers apply. Next slide, please. So we focused on two main research questions. Uh, first one is which specific health conditions are most strongly associated with poor housing among both children and adult Medicaid recipients? The second question was basically how to use this, right? So how can this Medicaid health data be used to target cities' building inspections to poor quality housing that may impact health. So to address the first research question, uh, click please, yeah, we identified 23 housing sensitive health conditions. So we performed a data-driven analysis using uh, New York State Medicaid data along with data from New York City's landlord watch list um, in order to identify these conditions. Uh, to address the second research question, thank you, um, we built a predictive machine learning model using a building's presence on the landlord watch list as the variable to be predicted and the set of housing sensitive health conditions as predictor variables. We called this model the housing health index. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, results of the first analysis, which is basically identifying the set of housing sensitive health conditions, which again, were basically the set of health conditions that were positively associated with poor housing among, um, you know, separately for adults and children. Um, the really nice thing here is even though we considered a very large set of housing sensitive health conditions, uh, basically 65 variables, or sorry, 65 health conditions across adults and children, so 130 variables, the ones that came out as significant actually group really nicely into five specific categories. Uh, so respiratory illness, specifically asthma, cardiovascular illness, substance use, injuries, and mental health. And we can see that there's a pretty uh, wide variety of significance levels here, but basically we considered anything that was at least weakly significant um, to be part of our model in order to increase its predictive accuracy. Next slide, please. So the main result I'd like to highlight for this short presentation is the following. So if you think about a building with high rates of housing sensitive health conditions, so what this means is a building that scored in the top decile of our housing health index and compare it to a similar building, so a similar size, a uh, similar neighborhood, it turns out that that building with high uh, housing health index is twice as likely to be on the New York City landlord watch list. But perhaps more importantly, it also has a number of um, other indicators of poor housing quality. So this includes 71% more um, citizen complaints or more 311 calls 
to New York City's Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Uh, also large increases in calls to New York City's Department of Buildings and Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. More emergency repairs, as well as more total and immediately hazardous housing violations. So I guess the point is really that no matter what sort of housing indicators you're looking at, buildings with these um, prevalence of housing sensitive health conditions, you know, that top decile really did come up as, uh, you know, as dramatically increased. Next slide, please. So a little bit about, uh, about how these results might be used in practice. We see really three different ways uh, cities could use the, the housing health index and the housing sensitive health conditions. So the first um, is since building uh, inspections tend to be reactive, well, the inspections for high housing health index buildings can be prioritized since these are the buildings that are most likely to have housing issues that may impact health. Second, when inspecting these buildings, we should inform housing inspectors of specific risks to, how, to residents' health that they should be looking at. So this could include things like looking at air quality risks for a building with high asthma rates. And third, we don't just have to be reactive. We could actually do proactive inspections to discover unreported housing issues that may be impacting health. Now, one note, of course, is that code inspections do have the risk of, um, you know, of depriving tenants of housing or having other negative consequences for them. So we argue in our paper that these housing inspections, the targeted housing inspections, should be paired with tenant protection, provision of social services, and community-based advocacy. Next slide, please. So that's basically all I wanted to say. Um, I did want to just put out an advertisement for the uh, Insider Journal Club event on February 26th, while I'll be go uh, where I'll be going into the work in much more detail. So thanks so much for listening. Thank you, and thanks for the pitch as well. Uh, Ashley, uh, over to you. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to first say thank you for attending and thank you for Health Affairs for putting this on. It's been wonderful to hear all these uh, interesting conversations about health and housing. And I'm really excited that I was able to contribute a bit by um, discussing my new project with my co-authors, Mira Lee and, and Catherine McLean. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. And the setting of this uh, study is going to be the 2005-10 care disenrollment. So we know, based on everything we've heard today, that housing instability is a major problem in the United States. We're currently going through a housing crisis, in addition to all of the various other crises that we're currently going through as a country. Uh, and housing instability is, is, is quite pervasive. So there's some estimates that in 2022, um, about half a million people in the U.S. would experience homelessness on any given night. And on average, about 3 million households uh, receive eviction notices each year in the United States. And we have some evidence about the relationship between health insurance coverage and housing stability. But most of the evidence that we do have comes from um, gaining health insurance. So what happens to housing outcomes uh, with Medicaid expansion? And we know much less about what happens when um, households lose their health insurance coverage. So what we're gonna be focusing on today, my co-authors and I, is the, um, the large Medicaid disenrollment that occurred in the Tennessee State Medicaid Program, which is called TenCare. Uh, and this resulted in about 190,000 people losing their Medicaid coverage. This is about 14% of the Medicaid um, enrollment population, about 3% of the overall state population. So this is a large and um, seemingly ex exogenous shock in which we see a lot of people suddenly losing the, their health care coverage. And so we're going to think about what the impact that might be on, on housing stability in the state. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're going to be leaning on is a, is a very standard difference in difference analysis. So we're going to be comparing the trends in our outcomes over time between the state of Tennessee, which um, experienced the disenrollment, and our uh, untreated states, which is going to be other south southern states. And so the, uh, the trends in the other southern states are going to act as our counterfactual estimate of what would have happened in Tennessee had the large-scale disenrollment not occurred. 
so we're just going to be comparing over time Tennessee to other southern states. And first, we're going to look at the impact that this disenrollment had on enrollment, right? We first want first stage evidence uh, to know that this, this policy change actually had some bite. And what we find is that this disenrollment led to about a 20% larger decrease in Medicaid enrollment in Tennessee relative to other, state, other Southern states. And then we go one step further to look at eviction outcomes. And specifically, we're gonna look at uh, evictions and eviction filings. And what we find is that, that this uh, large disenrollment led to about a 28% increase 28% uh, larger increase in eviction filings and a 25% larger increase in evictions in Tennessee compared to our other Southern states. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so you might be thinking this is quite an old uh, treatment, right? The disenrollment occurred in 2005, which is shockingly 20 years ago or almost 20 years ago. And the reason that, they, that we feel that these results are important and salient for what's going on in the world right now is, uh, as you might know, the Medicaid program or state Medicaid programs are currently undergoing an unwinding process. So as part of the um, uh, slew of bills that came out during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, states, in order to receive a bucket of money from the federal government, were required to continuously enroll their beneficiaries within the Medicaid program. That ended in 2003 with the Consolidation Appropriations Act, in which states, beginning on April 1st of 2023, were allowed to take a year to um, return to eligibility and enrollment um, operations, so to disenroll um, uh, a large number of beneficiaries. Now, it's been estimated that this unwinding process that's going to last, as I said, from April 1st, 2023 until the end of March of this year, it was expected that this would result in between 8 and 24 million people losing their Medicaid coverage. Uh, and as of January 2024, using data from just six months of this unwinding process, the, uh, it's estimated that about 16 million individuals have lost coverage already. This is from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And so, of course, it's difficult to directly extrapolate the results that we found in Tennessee in 2005 to today. There have been significant changes in the housing market. Um, we've seen changes in housing prices, housing availability, and the availability of uh, housing assistance. And there have been considerable changes to the way that health services are delivered in the United States, both in terms of a post-Affordable uh, Care Act world and if you can call it a post-COVID-19 a post -COVID world that we're living in right now. And importantly, the populations that were impacted are quite different. So with the 2005 10 care disenrollment, the uh, populations that were most um, uh, hit by this, this disenrollment were uh, non-elderly, non-disabled, childless adults. And the group that's uh, estimated to be the most directly impacted by the current Medicaid unwinding process are older adults, people with disabilities, immigrants, and people with limited English proficiency. So these are groups that you might expect to be much more vulnerable to issues of housing instability than the population that we saw impacted uh, in Tennessee. So although it is difficult to um, uh, directly extrapolate what we found in Tennessee, if what we found in Tennessee is even somewhat reflective of what we can expect to see nationally as states continue to um, undergo the unwinding process, then we could see a, uh, a wave of evictions exacerbate all of the issues that are already gonna come around with households losing their, their health insurance access through Medicaid. And so we think it's important that policymakers think about all the potential impacts of this Medicaid unwinding and consider ways to, to shield uh, individuals and households from uh, additional housing instability on top of already losing their, their health insurance coverage. So I, I will say next slide, but it's, it's my last one. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. And uh, Diana, last word over to you. Excellent, thank you so much uh, for uh, organizing this, um, I have to say that health affairs is uh, really unique um, in how hands-on it is in, in trying to get this information out. And so thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I am presenting on behalf of a really dynamic team 
um, that um, this paper was led by a, a postdoctoral trainee, um, Eva Siegel, um, at the Mailman School of Public Health, um, and also in collaboration with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, uh, and some really stellar uh, collaborators um, in, in that bureau, um, along with, uh, with a colleague, uh, Jennifer Laird, at um, uh, at, at Lehman College. Uh, today, I'll be talking about energy and security indicators associated with increased odds of respiratory, mental health, and cardiovascular conditions. Uh, we, of course, are talking about housing and health, and I see myself fundamentally as a housing researcher. Uh, but energy and energy and security is actually the kind of operating system of housing. So while we might be thinking about the context of housing when it comes to neighborhoods, there's this other kind of component um, of the housing experience, which is the, the kind of um, the, the operational aspects of it, what makes a home warm enough, cool enough, functional uh, from the perspective of appliances, lighting, et cetera. Uh, next slide. And so when we think about um, that operating system of housing, um, energy and security is uh, defined as the inability to meet household energy needs. And it is a multidimensional construct that has physical components, economic components, and coping dimensions that affect health. And that um, has already been established both um, in the in thought leadership, but also um, rooted in qualitative work uh, that really reflects the lived experience of energy and security. This work is actually an attempt to quantify indicators of energy and security along those domains. Next slide. So we completed the first representative study of energy insecurity and health um, in, uh, in New York City. It involved uh, 1,950 um, residents um, in New York City. And through waiting, uh, we were able to um, have this be a representative sample. So when I'm uh, uh, talking about the results, I'll be um, mentioning the results as reflective of New York City residents. And the purpose of uh, doing this work uh, was to better understand how energy insecurity manifests locally. So what are some of the kind of contextual drivers of energy insecurity? Um, and uh, how, how do we build on kind of existing indicators to be more comprehensive so we can't define an issue as being multidimensional, but still be using, for instance, energy burden. Uh, so an economic indicator to reflect this hardship. Um, a lot of the work that has been done has looked at uh, housing efficiency, for instance, uh, or uh, the economic components or some of the coping components, but not in tandem uh, or as a collective. And more importantly, uh, the work hasn't also um, included the, cumul the cumulative burden. So not just experiencing one aspect of energy insecurity, but, um, uh, but actually experiencing multiple. Uh, next slide. So um, in, in thinking about uh, or in measuring the prevalence of various um, energy insecurity indicators, we grouped uh, them based on these kind of physical, economic, and coping dimensions. Uh, we looked at, um, we asked participants about uh, their home being too hot or too cold, so ex exposure to extreme heat or extreme cold in their homes difficulty paying debt, disconnection notices, and service shutoffs due to non-payment. Uh, the difficulty paying is a novel measure, and the importance of that, especially in high-cost um, uh, housing markets like New York City, is that when the rent eats first and it eats a bigger pool, a, a bigger um uh, segment of that pie of your income, uh, then it means that there's less left over for uh, the smaller bills and the utility bills are a component of that. So we wanted to be able to measure a subjective, um, we want to have a subjective measure of difficulty paying and then arrearages as well. Um, 
And then the coping responses, uh, we uh, included uh, some that are influenced by the residential energy consumption survey. So the reducing um, energy uh, because of cost, but also um, looking more specifically at uh, questions of um, Re re reducing or foregoing comfort um, around air conditioning or heating uh, as a result of run costs, and then using heating alternatives like uh, the stove. Next slide. This is kind of um, a visualization of uh, the indicators, a big part of what we were doing with this larger study, which was funded by the Sloan Foundation and the JPB Foundation, along with Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation, is to uh, make this information more accessible and more actionable. So there's an active kind of science communication component to this. This is a part of that effort. Um, so these are the kind of disconnection, or I'm sorry, the, the suite of indicators um, that I previously mentioned. Uh, next slide. Uh, and what we found, so one, one primary goal of the work um, was to assess how, uh, how prevalent energy insecurity is in the city. Um, and what we found is that 28% of New Yorkers experience energy insecurity, which we define in this study as having experienced three or more of the previously mentioned indicators. We also know um, this work confirms that a lot of the, uh, that our results um, you know, are also based on deep inequities uh, that disparately impact uh, socially and economically vulnerable groups such that black and Latino and Latina um, residents uh, compared to white non-Latino residents are more likely to be energy insecure. Renters are more likely to be energy insecure. Recent immigrants um, are more likely compared to those uh, that, that have lived uh, in the U.S. for longer. And then households with children uh, are, are more likely. So this is confirmatory and consistent uh, with prior research. We also uh, wanted to um, see uh, what the associations are with health. Next slide. Um, and the real takeaway here is that people experiencing energy insecurity are more likely to experience worse health. Next slide. And that looks like um, that is really kind of across four critical domains, mental health. So households with three or more and, uh, indicators of energy insecurity um, experience adju an adjusted odds ratio of 3.9 uh, for mental health conditions. Um, also for respiratory conditions, there was an, an adjusted odds ratio of 2.2. Um, and uh, for uh, cardiovascular disease, an adjusted odds ratio of 2.2. Five, uh, having experienced uh, for those having experienced energy insecurity, and ironically enough, sadly enough, importantly enough, those that experience energy insecurity have an adjusted odds ratio of three point four for also um, having uh, using an electric medical device, meaning that. In many instances, people's very lives and their ability to manage whatever health condition uh, is requiring of uh, an electric medical device is at stake. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the take-homes are really about the linkages to housing and health disparities so that um, many of these um, issues in energy insecurity are happening in the same neighborhood context um, and uh, in, in uh, populations that we know uh, are connected to health disparities. Uh, that these uh, indicators are supporting evaluation of energy and security related policies and programmatic interventions. This is a demonstration of uh, academic and, go and government partnerships to track energy and security, so really leveraging uh, the resources and uh, health departments. This also um, this work also uh, has implications for continued measurement uh, refinement of the energy and security construct. This is really just the beginning, and we need to do more and access um, 
uh, to affordable energy um, and an energy efficient and comfortable home is really key to advancing health equity and climate um, adaptation. And with that, I'll, I'll end. Thank you very much. Please follow us. We've been doing this work um, on YouTube and, uh, and, and TikTok and Instagram uh, under the handle of Hot and Cold NYC, where we actually humanize this experience. Uh, so in addition to reading this work, please do follow us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I believe I failed to introduce uh, Andrew Fenelon from the University of Minnesota when I did the first run through due to a, my error, but I'm happy to turn it over to you. No problem at all. Thank you. Um, so thanks. I, I'm really excited to be presenting our work here today. I'm Andy Fenelon. I'm at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Uh, and I want to give most of the credit to my colleague, Selena Ortiz, uh, who masterminded this project. She's at Penn State. And this is also a collaboration with Yusuf Chabapur, who's a grad student at Penn State. Uh, so we're really interested in how to make the voucher program uh, work well as a source of affordable housing and as a means to improve health. Um, and the success of that program really depends on private landlords. Um, so it's a really important piece to consider. Um, so our work here is motivated by the, um, the recognition that vou vouchers are extremely valuable. Um, especially for their positive impacts on health, but they're tough to use. Um, and the benefit of going last in this is that others have, have already covered um, the voucher program and how it works, so I don't need to, to remind you too much. Uh, but just recall that the voucher program provides a subsidy that individuals use in the private market, uh, and it covers their um, the difference between what they can afford to pay and their rent up to the 40th percentile in the market. Um, now, as we saw with uh, evidence even in this issue from Sandy Newman and colleagues, uh, access to a voucher is good and it can improve your, your health and well being. Um, and we have experimental evidence on, on this, quasi experimental evidence. Um, but the housing voucher program requires the participation of private landlords since participating families rent private market units. Um, and in most localities, it's actually perfectly legal for, for landlords to refuse to rent to voucher recipients. This is problematic because it ends up being actually quite tough for voucher recipients to, to lease up with an amenable landlord. So work by Ingrid Ellen and colleagues has shown that many voucher recipients, as many as 40%, actually are not able to successfully lease up with a voucher before it expires. Uh, and as, as a result, it's clear that we're, we're going to need strategies to increase landlord participation in the program if we want health benefits to, to show up. Next slide. So we're working in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is not just physically beautiful, it's also the site of uh, a new mobility voucher program, which began in 2020. Um, the program seeks to encourage the use of vouchers in high opportunity neighborhoods, uh, termed mobility zones, by increasing the generosity of vouchers that are used in those areas. Uh, the program provides a supplement of 30% above the fair market rent, so above the 40th percentile for the, in, in those areas in order to create a financial incentive for landlords to participate. Uh, and so we wanted to examine the factors associated with landlords' interest in participating. And so we fielded a survey of Pittsburgh landlords focusing on small-scale small landlords who own rental properties in these mobility zones. And so in our, in our survey, we ran an experiment in which we exposed randomly assigned landlords to an asset framing narrative, which I'll, just, I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and we're examining the effects of this narrative on stated likelihood of participating in the mobility voucher program. Next slide. So asset framing techniques have been used to shift negative beliefs about subjects by emphasizing strength and, strengths and contributions, assets, uh, and while recognizing structural barriers that individuals face. And so in our survey experiment, we asked landlords to read the following vignette, which tells the story of a mother who saw mental health improvements uh, following entrance into the mobility voucher program. Uh, so this, this is a, an abridged version of it here. Sherry is a 32-year-old mother of two. She works hard to provide for her her children, is attentive to their needs, and strives to create a nurturing home environment. Yet because of the high cost of rent, Sherry had a hard time securing stable quality housing for her family. Last year through the Mobility Voucher Program, Sherry and her family were able to move into a neighborhood with good schools, playgrounds, full service grocery stores, et cetera. Sherry noticed a change in her mood and her quality of life. She experiences significantly less stress and worry, which allowed her to plan for her family's future Sherry feels proud that she can provide a safe and secure home for her family. And so we're interested in whether reading this narrative leads landlords to be more likely to report willingness to rent a mobility voucher recipients. Next slide. 
So our main finding is this experimental result, which is really promising. So exposure to the narrative raises the fraction reporting that they're either likely or very likely to, uh, to rent to mobility voucher recipients from about a quarter to 46%. And, and this is a big, uh, a big increase, and, and we're getting close to half here. But it, it's important to note that even though this is a large increase, there, there's still plenty of potential to move the needle further. Next slide. So the, this experiment has implications for housing policy as, as we think it relates to health, uh, because the success of the voucher program, as I mentioned, depends on landlords participating. And so if we, if we want to see health benefits of receiving vouchers for families that are able to access them, we're going to need to increase the likelihood that, um, that amenable landlords are out there to, uh, to rent to voucher recipients. And, and these health benefits are going to be limited if, um, if there are not landlords willing to, to rent to voucher recipients. And as we saw, even in, in our survey here in the control group, baseline interest in participation in this program is pretty low, only about a quarter. And, and further, as the program seeks to um, promote mobility, so to provide the chance for voucher recipients to move to high opportunity neighborhoods, outreach and increasing participation is gonna become even more important since this is almost certainly gonna require, require the participation of landlords who have little prior experience with the program. Now, our, our results highlight a potentially powerful tool to increase landlord participation. So that the asset framing narrative that, that we use increases the likelihood of um, the reported likelihood of participation. Now, it's unclear whether this translates into actual participation in practice, but I think it's an important start. And we suggest that, that these are the sorts of narratives that could be part of outreach materials that housing authorities use in their communication with landlords. Final slide. So I wanna acknowledge funding for this project from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Policies for Action. Uh, and note, of course, that these are our, um, our views and not those of the foundation. And I also wanna acknowledge our collaborators at the Housing Authority of the City of Pittsburgh, Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania, and Penn State Survey Research Center. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you all. And as we come toward the end of this, we only have a few minutes for discussion. Again, these are quite different papers. So I wanna ask sort of more of a thematic question. If you go back to our first panel, we talked about the importance of neighborhoods and most of the discussion there was about things like access to uh, healthy uh, food and uh, uh, access to jobs, transportation, clean air. Um, and that clearly has a tie, neighborhoods uh, have a tie to people's health. All of you are speaking much more about the quality of the housing itself and the financial burden associated with housing, which is a different dimension. So I'm asking you all to think about the health audience that we have here and try to help all of us understand when we see big differences in health outcomes by neighborhood, to what degree do we attribute it or should we attribute it to sort of neighborhood characteristics as, as, as opposed to the more what I would consider the housing characteristics that you all described? Uh, is it both? Is it both equally? It's certainly both. It's always both. But is it both equally? Should we emphasize one or the other? Because it seems like we need a place to start. Uh, Sandy, you've got your... Oh, you're on mute. Wait. Uh, so, uh, just a, a minor correction, Alan. So, in our study, actually, we did find a little bit of juice in um, what many considered to be, uh, and I would, uh, to one of the most important aspects of neighborhood, which probably is a summative measure that incorporates a lot more than just danger or safety of neighborhood. It has a whole range of things. So, we did find that reporting feeling safe in the neighborhood during the daytime uh, did have some impact on reducing stress. And of course, um, in the MTO study, one of the major findings uh, was that women and girls felt a lot safer in the new neighborhood, reducing uh, the stress that they were experiencing. So I think this is a little bit of a continuation of that. Uh, we did not go in, but we, we do uh, systematic social observations in the neighborhoods. Um, we find that those are not that easy to work with. Um, and, um, you know, I think uh, as, as 
our approach with the voucher, the unpacking of the notion of the neighborhood, which elements really matter, uh, what are the mechanisms. So we talk about um, place, what is place? What are the features of place that really make the biggest difference? And uh, I personally think that's the best best approach to figure this out. It's very helpful. Other thoughts on this broader question? I, I like well, to think, oh. go ahead, Dana. Okay, I like to think of these as also like uh, the tensions, right? Where people are making choices. Uh, and and sometimes those choices are also about the constraints um, driven by policies and you know kind of their legacy of uh, red line redlining for instance and the discriminatory practices. I think Andrew's work, for instance, really showing you know kind of landlord interest and whether or not um, voucher holders can actually access high quality not just neighborhoods but actual housing units. And a lot of the research has suggested that in fact, uh, when people are uh, needing to make choices between housing affordability and neighborhood context and even housing unit quality, uh, that oftentimes folks are relegated to the worst kind of possible housing, not just in the worst possible neighborhoods, um, but also in the units themselves. And so this is really like an interplay and focusing on that, I think is important. And energy is actually one of the manifestations of the conditions aspect. That's very interesting. Go ahead, Andrew. Um, so I, the, the thing I wanted to add to that is that there, there we, we can sometimes be overly focused on the neighborhood as, as a mechanism through which housing affects health, that there are a lot of aspects of housing, say affordability, stability, um, that manifest in the ability to control one's life, the ability to get access to healthcare. Um, and sometimes we, we think too, maybe a little bit too much about moving people from um, low opportunity neighborhoods to high opportunity neighborhoods as, as the goal rather than one of many goals. Um, not that I think it's a bad goal, but I, I think it should be considered um, in context. It does seem, Daniel, like your work also speaks to this because you're looking within neighborhoods at specific locations and seeing very high levels of variability. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's right. So, I mean, we were doing the best we could to you know, isolate building level factors. Uh, but, you know, I mean, to be honest, there's still absolutely some confounding. Um, as an example, one of the you know follow up analyses we've been looking at has uh, you know we, you know we 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 saw increased rates of respiratory illness among you know essentially uh, uh, Asian individuals living in New York City's Chinatown as compared to Asian individuals you know living kind of elsewhere in Manhattan, um, and you know th there you know we realized well that could have been a building level effect. Um, the building materials, et cetera. But it also, you know, it turns out that there's worse outdoor air quality in that area because of kind of the Chinatown bus effect. And so, you know, at that point we can say, well, you know, we know there's a total effect, but we we did, you know, we didn't have the data to actually distinguish those or, to, you know, to tease apart those uh, confounding factors. Uh, well, we really are at the end of time. We do end on time at Health Affairs. I do want to note there was a question about accessibility of housing. I, I believe they mean in terms of like uh, physical uh, mobility. And that is another dimension of the relationship between housing and health that unfortunately we didn't really get into today. But the notion uh, that uh, that uh, needs of housing vary by people's uh, mobility and and. Uh, that has to be part of the question of what it means to have adequate housing. So I just want to note that for the audience. Well, thank you all uh, for being our last panel. Uh, to our audience, as we come to a close, again, this was recorded. We encourage you uh, in a couple of days, we'll post it and you can share it. I do want to thank our funders, Kaiser Permanente, the Colorado Health Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the California Healthcare Foundation, and the California Endowment. I want to draw your attention to the artwork that we've shown from uh, art from the streets uh, and uh, again to thank our theme issue advisors Mariana Arkaya at MIT and Ingrid Gould Ellen at NYU uh, who uh, led us through uh, this process uh, but we uh, we could not have uh, done all of this without all of them. 
Uh, we will continue to do more work in this area. Um, you did hear a little uh, advertisement for uh, the Journal Club um, on housing uh, sensitive con uh, health conditions. That's on February 26th. Uh, before then on the 22nd, I'll be doing a one-on-one -on -one discussion with Nikki Tripathi, the uh, National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. That is open to all, whereas the Journal Club is for insiders, which is a a special subscription uh, program uh, that we have here at Health Affairs. All of the content of this of the issue covered today is available at no charge, thanks to our funders. Uh, and as I mentioned, of course, the recording will be available as well. So uh, keep an eye out for additional content associated uh, with the relationship between housing and health. We're so thrilled to have been able to share all of this good content content with you. Um, and for our first ever theme issue on this topic, uh, there's clearly much more uh, to plumb. Uh, and uh, we will we'll continue our work in this area. And with that, um, thank you for sticking with us for a full uh, afternoon. We are adjourned.